Hey everyone, Matt Lanfer here with Primary and Secondary. This is Modcast 19. We have Terrell, we have Roland, we have Matt Meckley, Matt Wicks, and Bill. I'm not even going to bother saying your last name because I'm just disgusted by you. <laughs> we have some, uh, some questions to start out with. The first question, and also we're going to be taking some questions. Or, yeah. So let's see here. This first question goes to Roland, talking about his thoughts, tips and tricks, employment and equipment setup of belt feds. Yeah, I can't comment on that at all. All I can do is read it. So Roland. So, um, yeah, the, the, the first point is, you know, not all, not all belt feds are, are created equal. Uh, when you start talking about medium medium machine guns, and I would I would define uh, medium machine gun as like uh, M60 or 240 uh, Bravo. Um, that those guns are designed to be employed uh, by a team, not by an individual, and they're designed to provide sustained fire in support of maneuver, so that you can fix the enemy uh, while you close on them and and then finish them. Um, that that that's why they exist. Uh, so, so sustained fire machine guns don't need things like, um, flashlights, uh, on them because, because they're not going to be used in an assault role whatsoever. So on a, on a 240 type gun, uh, there's different trains of thoughts about having optics or not having optics, uh, on, on a, on a machine gun. Um, <clears throat> I like the I like the 762 ACOG. Um, it's you know three, three or three and a half power. Uh, it's got an okay eye relief and the you know it's ballistically calibrated for for the 762 cartridge. Uh, the issue that you get into is uh, when when I've shot dudes that had optics uh, versus dudes that didn't is the guys that had optics could potentially identify threats better -er, but then they started trying to spot their own rounds through their glass and they were not listening to their assistant gunner or their ammo bearer. And then, then now we're getting into uh, the TTPs of a machine gun team operating as a machine gun team, giving out, you know, elements of, uh, you know, uh, machine gun fire commands, uh, you know, a direction, distance, rate of fire, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so now that it, it, you're taking the gunner and he's looking through this optic, whether it be a red dot or a, a low power magnifier, you know, M145, MGO, whatever. And the guy's like, boom, 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 boom. And he's firing and he's seeing his tracers going down range and his AG's talking to him, you know, like right three up one and dude's just totally ignoring his, his AG because he thinks he saw where his burst went. And so he's self-correcting and firing and he becomes an individual at that point. So the, I, I've actually seen optics detract from the ability of a machine gun team to act uh, in, in synergy with one another. Uh, okay, so moving, moving down to light machine gun slash automatic rifles. Uh, the Mark 48, Mark 46, M249, Ultimax, you know, uh, whatever. IAR when, when employed in the fully automatic uh, mode. Um, those guns need to be configured to be able to fucking kick doors. You need to be able to, and, and to include your training path, uh, we held our saw gunners to the same accuracy standards as our riflemen. So at 25, when he shouldered that saw, he would have to fire a three-round burst and keep all three rounds in what is essentially like your A zone of an IPSEC target. Like he was not allowed to get lazy and just kind of hump that weight up there and then let the recoil of the weapon track off across the target. Like, no, unacceptable. You're doing CQB. You're going in this fucking house as a three or four man, and you're going to be expected to target discriminate and shoot threat and non-threat fucking targets with an open bolt fucking belt fed machine gun. Deal with it. So where everybody else is firing controlled pairs in the shoot house, the saw gunner is required to fire a three round burst and he has to keep that shit tight. So, um, all of your considerations for an assault, um, rifle now start to apply to the saw. So you've got 
a flashlight because, you know, maybe you guys are clearing under white light. You've got your IR pointer. You've got, um, you know, some type of, of red dot or low power fucking optic on your saw. And now you've got to figure out, and it's a lot harder on uh, light machine guns because of the heat uh, around the barrel and because of the bipods. Uh, it's much harder. It's much harder to get your switchology down. It's it's much more difficult uh, because of where those bipods are, are at and how they're configured. So if you put a G grip on your gun, uh, you know you put a front grip on your gun and you start running tape switches down to the front grip and hold them on there with bicycle inner tube or, or whatever you're doing, now you've lost your ability to fold your bipods in. The, your bipods can't fold to the, to the 6 o'clock because you've got a, a, a gangster grip on the bottom. So, um, so now you've got to come up with workarounds for, for that. You know, the Mark 46 uh, solved that problem. Uh, they, they ran a, a spacer at the base of the bipod where the, the two legs come together, and the spacer is about, I don't know, an inch and a half, two inches long. Uh, same thing with the Mark 48. And so it was designed to let the bipod legs collapse and go up into the channels to the left and right side of the 6 o'clock Picatinny rail, whereas the – the original army design, when they went to a Picatinny four end assembly, uh, the, the bipods actually click into the, um, a gap in the, in the 1913 rail directly at the six o'clock. So you, you pin the bipod legs together and then fold them directly back up to the six o'clock. So uh, in my experience, most of uh, most saws are set up better with, um, with, with some type of front grip. Now, I've seen people take the bipods off the machine gun altogether uh, and run a grip pod so they can they use the grip pod to steady their gun. I've also seen it done with the Mark 48. So they've got a front grip that they can put pressure pads on to be able to activate lights and or lasers, um, turn them on, turn them off uh, on command when they need it. Uh, they've got the stability so that they can shoulder fire the weapon by the front grip. They can they can keep that gun in. They can manage that recoil, and uh, and then if they need to go prone, they pop the grip pod. Problem with that is that the grip pod is a very sloppy design. It, it's got a lot of slop in it. So when you talk about loading the bipods to be able to manage recoil to give you a tighter cone of fire, which transitions into a tighter beaten zone downrange when you're shooting transitional targets hundreds of meters out there. Um, the sloppier your shit is, whether that be tripods, ring mounts on vehicles, or bipod fire, the sloppier that gun is, the wider your cone of fire, and the, more, uh, the less lethal your beaten zone is because of your shot dispersion. Um, so... I was not a big fan of running a uh, grip pod on the M249. Uh, I, my, my material solution was I had a piece of Velcro that I had sewn and it was goosenecked basically around the top of like a Knight's Armor, it's broom handle front grip. And it was a tab with hook and pile. So I could collapse the bipod, pull it to the six o'clock and then offset it to the right side of the G grip. And then I would, I'd wrap that piece of Velcro around the bipod and back onto itself, and it would pin the bipod in the closed position just off to the right side of my G grip at like you know 5:30 ish. And if I needed to go back to buy, uh, go back to the prone again, uh, I'd just pop the Velcro tab, and the bipods would would fold and un uh, fall and, and unfold in front of me, so I could get the gun down on the prone and get accurate uh, accurate uh, beaten zone at distance. So that that was my personal. Uh, configuration um, for the I forgot going back to the medium machine guns if you're gonna set up your medium machine guns you're gonna want to probably have your laser on the left hand side uh, and the reason for that is so that either you or the assistant gunner can manually operate the uh, the button on the pack 15 or la5 uh, pack 2 whatever you got going on um, they make extended cables and they make these adhesive little J hooks that are designed to like 
route fucking pressure pad cables and you can see some machine guns that are like all set up all sexy and the guy takes the time and he's he's sticking these little sticky hooks on the side of his machine gun going all the way back and then he velcros the pressure uh pad to the firing grip of the machine gun so that he can just use his firing hand uh, fingers as they're wrapped around and hit the little button and activate his IR laser and turn it on and turn it off. Um, in, in my experience though, um, you know, just look at, just look at the preponderance of people that shoot carbines and how many dudes are tape switch haters. And you're talking about this big, beefy, robust, surefire tape switch that's only about three and a half inches long and it is fucking thick and it costs a lot of money and surefire spent all this time to make it effective and people still don't trust that shit. Now you go to insights tape switch and it's fucking got 18 inches of fucking cable. It's not as well fucking rubberized or rubberized or protected. And it's, Oh, by the way, it's going behind your belt of ammunition. That's getting fed into the gun at a rapid rate. So what do y'all think the chances are that maybe the machine gun belt, the tip of one of your fucking cartridges could grab that fucking cable switch and then suck it into the machine gun and cause a malfunction and sever your tape switch. I'll tell you, I seen it. I seen it. So, um, <laughs> you gotta, you just gotta, you know, Hey man, simple, keep it simple. Re reach your ass over the belt, push the button two times on your laser to turn it on constant and scan your sector, use your flood to fucking identify threats and get your shit on. And then when it's fucking done, either you or your AG fucking reach up there, fucking hit the button again, turn your fucking laser off. Keep it simple. Um, slings, uh, you got, you, again, you got to have your slings set up to be able to do pistol transitions if you're doing housework. So if you've got a saw, you're going to need a two point adjustable, um, probably doesn't need to be as padded on the 240. You're going to need a, a thicker, more padded sling. Uh, blue force gear makes a uh, machine gun sling. They sent me the first prototype when I was downrange in Iraq in 2005. Um, and I carried it on my, on my machine gun down range. Uh, they use Nomex up front. So if your sling touches the fucking barrel, uh, you've got some HR to keep your sling from getting melted. And it's essentially, you know, your Vickers sling style sliding, uh, mechanism, but it's got a really thick fat padded, um, nape strap, uh, for carrying the 240 machine gun. And it's, it's made out of FR material. So I'm, I'm a big fan, uh, for dudes that are humping full size two forties. Um, I'm a big fan of the, uh, blue force gear, uh, machine gunsling. So I think that's, uh, that's about all I got to say about lighter, medium machine guns. There was a follow-up, uh, asking about the use of the Elkan, Elkan Spectre DR on a saw. Yeah, I've seen it. I, I've, I've seen it. And I, and I would, I would say that when you're talking about, you know, a light machine gun, uh, your accuracy is just not any open bolt weapons, not going to be as accurate as a closed bolt system, uh, because you've got all that inertia and moving parts. So if, after you, after you pull the trigger and release the sear, uh, your, your spring, uh, housing is, pushing all of that mass, uh, your operating rod and your bolt carrier bolt group, they're all moving forward within the chassis of the gun. And then, uh, when they get to the, you know, so, so um, when they get to the, uh, feed tray, now they're stripping around out of a belt of ammunition and that round has to move down and then go into the, the bore and the gun doesn't actually go bang until the spring has pushed that bolt all the way forward and it's locked. And then when it's in the locked position, um, the, the machine guns operate on what we call a, f a fixed firing pin. So when, when the bolt rotates into a fully locked position that exposes the firing pin and the firing pin is, is rigid, uh, it's locked in there. So the, the gun goes bang. So there's a lag from the time that you pull the trigger until you get a bang. And then there's, there's, you know, weight, weight shift going on in the gun. And that's why belt feds are never going to be, can't, can't ever be as accurate as, as closed bolt systems. Um, 
So that, so that being said, all the things that I don't like about an Elkan in terms of zero shift repeatability, um, you know, all, all those, all those things, they don't apply as much when you're, when you're talking about, uh, machine guns. So the, the six power Elkan, uh, is a, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good optic for, for a belt fed. Um, I, I've never, that, that's never been my personal choice, but I know plenty that do use the Elkan on, on belt feds, the Spectre DR specifically. Hey, Bronson, did you have something to add on? I see how you are. So uh, what do you guys think of the M27 as a closed bolt belt fed alternative? Well, isn't it? It's not technically closed bolt. It runs open bolt. I just read the, yeah, I'm just reading exactly what the question was. So on full auto, it's open bolt. And then on semi-auto, it's closed bolt. I think the ironic part is it's making more of a case for accurized rifles as, as it just across the board um, than it is making the case for the initial concept it was derived for. I mean, like, uh, didn't they, somebody mentioned like an entire study where they put like M16A4s, did the qual scores, and then took those same rifles, swapped them all out for IARs, and they were getting higher qual scores just based off the IR on single shot or semi-auto. Um, and I mean, that's because better barrel, free float, you know, the, the whole nine yards. And just to preface, I've never shot the damn thing. And I'll add hinge cuffs. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that I think the IAR is a it's an okay piece of kit. You know, I, I um. If you are, if you're providing direct support for, um, you know, and down at the squad level, it's not fire and maneuver, it's fire and movement. But um, if you're, if you're providing uh, s suppressive fire for dudes that are, I'm up, he sees me, I'm down. Um, your mag changes have got to be freaking on point. And that's why um, uh, other countries like uh, the, um, light support weapon, the long version of the SA-80 that has the bipods on it. And uh, the, the Aussies did the same thing with the AUG. They had an extended barreled AUG with bipod legs on it. And those those were all of their uh, solutions at the time for automatic riflemen. And uh, most of those armies figured out that uh, a dude that is trying to provide suppressive fire with 30-round magazines uh, or extended 40-round mags is just in their mag changing constantly. So you get these lulls in fire when dudes are still up and trying to move. Um, and the, the guy that's responsible or supposed to be keeping their heads down is uh, getting the weapon back into the fight. So that, that's where you're going to see a uh, benefit of having your belt fed systems that have, you know, more ammunition on, on tap. Uh, the D60 could, could absolutely be a game changer. Uh, you know, if you, if you started, uh, employing the D60 with the M27 as a platform. Now you can go twice as long before you get one of those lulls in fire. Then you got to do a mag change. And when you're mag changing, you're getting twice as many bullets in the gun as you are with a conventional magazine. Um, so, the, you know, I think that's a, that's a, a pretty good mitigating measure for that, that, that those few times where you're making the IAR be a light machine gun. If no one else has anything to say, I have the next question. Yes, y you there. I think you just muted yourself. Uh, Ron, what do you think about putting a uh, laser, a uh, rangefinder on a like a 240, 
so that, that the gunner can get better first round hits because he knows what the range is. Since it's the most casually producing weapon that, that, that you have in a platoon. Thoughts? I, th I think I know where you're going with this one. Um, I, I think that as we continue to push, uh, um, I would be I would be concerned about weight if I had to put an LA five and uh, a ruler or whatever on on my gun. If I could get industry to make an an LRF that still had high performance. IR still had the power that I needed to be able to throw flood out far distance, had the milliwatts of power to get the throw for my flood and to get my spot out there to six, 700 meters at night, whatever, uh, in, in one housing, uh, I think that would absolutely be beneficial. Um, hundred percent. There to go along with that, uh, weight on the machine gun, I wouldn't want to put a few put, say, like a Storm or the Silencer Co. LRF they just released on a leadership's weapon that they can utilize for a weapon squad. I'd be all about it. Uh, currently, we have that with the M320s. Their BII includes uh, this bullshit little bush range finder, but it's pretty accurate. So about 800 meters. So you just tell the ship and weapon squads. I think the uh, the biggest problem you'll run into is uh, long term durability of that LRF. Uh, I, I definitely see the application. I can see it in a lot of different avenues, um, but that that thing taking fucking repeated beating. Uh, those are the good ones, especially are are tough, but they're they're also very cost intensive. Um, it's I mean as we saw recently, um, they're you know it's not quite up to snuff to where it needs to be in terms of durability. Um, I'd, be, I'd be worried. It'd be one of those things where it's like, yeah, because Uncle Sam's paying for it, but uh, it, you might end up with a high rate of failure due to the repeated beating those things get. Yeah, you, you definitely get what you pay for in terms of uh, power and um power and performance uh, with laser range finders. It's much like, like IR laser systems. Uh, you know, we had, uh, we had Leica uh, vectors for a while and that was a, that was a freaking good piece of kit, especially when you added the bug eyes on the front, you could, uh, you could really see out there with that thing, but they were big, you know? And so the Mark sevens came out and everybody's like, Oh, look at the Mark seven. It's fucking Ninja. I could stick it in my cargo pocket, whatever. And I went to, Germany and I was doing some long gunning there and it fucking started to snow and I mean snow bad big big fat snowflakes and I'm trying to laze through the snowfall and I wasn't getting returns for fuck I that mark 7 was getting its shit pushed in and the Deutschers had fucking like a vectors and they were like bzz, 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 and fucking banging out some fucking ranges. And I came back from that experience and I was like, you know what? Smaller and lighter is not always fucking better. And I, I like, like I had to go find like in the warehouse, Hey, do we have any fucking vectors left? And they're like, yeah, we were just about to turn them in. I was like, Nope, don't turn them in. I'm going to fucking sign for one. And I went back to uh, the, the vector uh, over the Mark seven for, for that express reason. Cause po power equals performance. And then, uh, well, at least with handheld LRFs, I know we're kind of getting off topic on the conversation, but the one thing I've found with the, the monoculars, like the Plurf 10, the, the Terrapin, the Plurf 15, um, they just, they don't have the magnif magnification to be really, really usable when it comes to searching for targets. Like I always try to chunk down the kit that I'm carrying to the bare minimum. Um, if I can find a dual use for something I do, like for example, the, uh, the Leica GHD or basically their, their binocular GeoVid um, is, is really nice. And the Vectronics one, the, uh, the, uh, their, I forget what, what it's called. Um, mosquito. Yeah. The mosquito. Uh, well, the mosquito and then the one they make that's actually a binocular um, having that extra eight X magnification over a five or a six X that's you see typical with the monocular 
um, and then having that wider field of view, um, you, you get more light coming through the glass, you know, so you get a little bit more staying power as it gets darker. Uh, it, it, it makes so much difference when you're looking for targets and now you're cutting down now I have to, don't have to take binoculars cause I've got a fucking spot or an LRF that can do the same job. So you're cutting weight and adding capability on top of that. Um, but yeah, you're not, you're not joking when it comes to LRFs and accuracy in terms of what you pay for. I mean, speaking recently, I, I purchased a, a Vectronics one and holy fuck, man, they're expensive. They're worth it, but they're expensive. Yep. Next one. Hey, so I got to correct something I said earlier. The uh, I think I was thinking of one of the prototypes of the IAR. It's it's all closed bolt. So I just looked it up. Now, I I wasn't going to call you out on that, but yeah, I I, I pretty oh, much sure thought have. it was the yeah. only. It, it was, was the prototype the, that I was thinking of. Um, I think it was the LWRC prototype. That, that is correct. It, yeah. It, 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 uh, the, the 27 was the only one of the test systems that did not have an open bolt option. Yeah. So I stand corrected. Sir. Okay, next question. This one is focused on Roland, but I think pretty much everyone on the panel, except for me, can answer this with, with great confidence. What knife did Roland keep him with keep with him on the job? It's a question. They want to know. Uh, folders. Um, I got I carry a, you know, whatever, Spyderco or a Benchmade or or whatever. Uh, if I don't have it in, in my pocket, if I don't have it in, in one of my um you know, hand pockets. Uh, I, I'll have like a small bench made in uh, the f front pocket next to my Leatherman and a, a single cell torch. So I'll carry a multi-tool small pocket knife and a, a E1B backup, uh, all of them in um, the, one of the front pockets on, on either my field or, or combat pants. Uh, I'll also carry a ASP uh, flex cuff cutter up there for, um, cause I've just, I've seen way too many dudes catch hassle from taking a knife, trying to cut a dude's flex cuffs off and stabbing them in the fucking back when the, when the plastic zip ties go. Um, and you know, the, it's liability. It's, it's, you know, it's liability. You, you bring a dude to the, to the detention center and he's fucking stabbed. Uh, the first thing they're going to do is give him a medical exam. And next thing you're, you're having to do sworn statements because somebody, you know, they just made, they made a legitimate mistake, you know, they just, but they, they poked the dude. So, uh, yeah, I, I got on board with flex cuff cutters early. Um, but, uh, as far as fixed blade knives, uh, I like pokey stabbies, the, um, uh, Spartan blades has a, uh, a fighting tool that's basically the same design as the Benchmade uh, so Sock P or whatever it is, the, the dagger. Um, the, the, the guy that designed that thing, he, he did it through Spartan Blades first and then went, then went big mainstream with Benchmade after that. Uh, so the, the blade designs are, are generally the same. The Benchmade is a little bit longer. Uh, it's closer to probably four inches of stabbiness, and it's got a better sheath. Uh, that will fit down, uh, you know, inside of a Molly uh, pals channel and, and, and kind of lock in there. So I'll either carry a, a sock P or I also have a Winkler uh, fighting dagger um, that's got, instead of a wooden grip, it's got uh, rubber, like tire rubber, shredded tire rubber type, uh, type grip so I can keep my hand on it because it doesn't have a hilt. Uh, so I can keep my hand on it when it's, you know, muddy, muddy, bloody. Um, and, and still get in there and, and slip it between ribs and shit. And it's, it's got probably five and a half, almost six inches of depth to it. Feel free to jump in if you have anything to add. Uh, in Afghanistan, I carried a uh, karambit 
the guy, uh, yeah, I still have it here. So I carried this behind my magazines on my plate carrier. So the cram bit I could use ambidextrously. It was mounted like this, so I could use a reverse grip with the right hand, or if it was mounted the same way, standard grip with my left hand. So far has killed one pickle. Yeah, that's a pretty fun story about that one. Seriously, no one else has something to say. We all are carrying knives. So, yeah, I mean, so our SWAT guys are issued the sock P, like Roland talked about. Um, got those knives pretty early on. Uh, we're all carrying fucking tomahawks. And then uh, just recently, um, we all got issued the, uh, I forget the fucking model number, but it's a, a bench made. Um, yeah, exactly what Taryn's holding up right there is the sock P, you know, a trainer, it looks like. Um, but we got the bench made autos uh, with the auto strap cutter and the fucking glass breaker on them. We're, uh, for vehicle assaults and shit, uh, we're using halyards to bust the glass anyway, uh, but we've had a couple of occasions where shit was static, um, went mobile, and then we're trying to fucking smash glass with a uh, with the muzzle of a fucking gun, which sucks ass. So, uh, issuing a little uh, folding knife with a glass breaker on it so that it's always on their kit, and, and they don't have to worry about fucking grabbing it. I did get, um, we've had a couple different tomahawk breaches, but I, uh, I got a pretty sweet tomahawk breach. It was right after we got them, and... Uh, serving a couple of warrants but we end up in a music studio this fucking uh, gangster had a had a rap studio so we serve the warrant we can see through the fucking glass from the studio to the control room so we can see it's clear but we got to step foot in there basically and, and do the actual boots on the ground clear well that door is locked so i'm like hey fuck that i'm gonna breach this bitch with a tomahawk right there's no time on this to it so I'm going to spike it and fucking pry through this motherfucker. And I do my backswing and he had a goddamn one of the big ass five gallon water bottles behind me. And I <laughs> broke that bitch on the backswing. So not really the way you want to get it done, but there you go for patrol. I, I mean, I always carry a fucking auto knife on me. Um, and then I have a bunch of different fucking folders as well. Carried a uh, small fixed blade, um, for a little bit appendix. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just kind of fucking varies, man. But I, I usually always have some kind of cutting implement on me for, uh, for uh, uh, flex cuffs and shit, we just use our medical shears that come out, and, and then we'll cut people free that way so we don't chop them up with a knife. Yeah, it's a twofer for me for work. It's uh, the SOCP Benchmade. I've got it stuffed right in the front of my plate carrier uh, where I can grab it with either hand, whatever's free. Um, and it's underneath a button down shirt, so there's some problems there, but uh, that and just a basic strider folder or a, I think I have a, an Emerson sitting over there um, just cutting MREs that kind of thing like general tasks so I suppose we'll move to the next question next question is even during the day we have night or we have we have darkness. It's been a long day. We have darkness. Uh, some of us are are running weapon lights. Pretty much everyone has some some form of a handheld. What are the handhelds you you guys are running for everyday carry? I get a Surefire EB2 uh, with the momentary switch. So I think it's like five on the low end, and then if you press it harder you get 500 it's pretty good um it's a lot slimmer than the than the g2x or whatever that i had before that so i like it for me it's either a well they're both sure fires but either the 500 lumen fury or the thousand But daily, there's a. I have a weapon light. No gun though, just the weapon light. So I roll. It's mounted to the Fury. Yeah, I tape a Fury to my knife. So. And with that knife, is there a ring at the end? And are you afraid of getting degloved? 
I, I, I've never, um, well, the sock pee has a ring on it, but I rarely thread my finger through it. Um, I'm just, you know, kind of worried about being attached to it or having to uh, do something to my fucking finger. I, and maybe that's just paranoia from enough, uh, blue gun type training, um, where fingers get inside trigger guards and get fucking smashed up and shit. Um, you know, uh, it's just not my cup of tea. I don't, I know I'm not opposed to them, uh, but I, I haven't done enough training with it to feel comfortable. So. And that does lead on to the next question. But if you want to talk about flashlights, please do so. Um, I, I'm currently carrying an E2D uh, Defender Ultra. So I think this thing's like, I don't know, five or 600 lumens. It's a two cell. And then I've got uh, the new one cells that, it, that have been bumped up. And uh, on the single cells, I will replace the back cap with a Scout Light. Uh, push button so it provides a protective shield to keep from having white light ADs in my pocket uh, when I'm bending over or sitting down or whatever. So I will, I'll replace the the standard backup tail cap with a uh, with a Scout Light tail cap. All right. Well, I guess we'll go to the next section where. Matt Meckley tells us all about his exciting week and Terrell can listen and make fun of him for inaccurate oh, statements. Terrell's got plenty of material to make fun of me for. So I'll, I'll hand the floor over to him on the LROC. Cause that's, that's his deal. I was just a fucking RO monkey. So Terrell, how'd it go? Uh, I think it went, I think it went pretty well. Uh, I had, 26 teams from around the country uh, and, and Canada. I had uh, two military teams from, uh, you know, two-man teams from uh, Hawaii, the Gimlets. Then I had uh, a team from Alaska, also Gimlets. And I had two and a half teams from uh, Fort Lewis or JBLM, as it's now called, uh, participate. Then I had a bunch of civilian shooters, uh, a couple shooters from uh, Canada, I had shooters from as far away as Arizona. Uh, it turned out pretty well. I mean, yeah, we had some hiccups, like, you know, some range things happened that always happened. You know, Murphy, he plays always plays a role. The weather was great on Saturday. Uh, we had great temperatures. Uh, the weather was pretty nice on Sunday once it finally warmed up. Uh, shot, what, I think what, 13, 14 stages. Uh, I mean, it's all kind of a blur because Matt showed up and uh, pulled into my house and we loaded up his truck and loaded up my car and we drove out to uh, Colville and started going and picked up the guys on Thursday and Friday and we, we trained those those military guys. I gave them free classes on how to shoot movers. I just participated in a, in a one-year survey for the DOD uh, called J-Snipe'em, the Joint Sniper Performance Improvement uh, methodology, quick reaction test. So I took that knowledge I had just I had gained additionally about how to shoot movers, and I taught the uh, young snipers that. And not all of them were sniper trained. Some of them had only, you know, been in the section, hadn't been to school yet. They're still trying to figure everything out. So we went to the range on Thursday, gave them a class in, in, in the room on Thursday morning, went to the range Thursday afternoon, shot for a couple hours, we shot a mover at uh, 680 meters going three miles an hour and it got to the guys who were comfortable with it. So they're able to engage it using some, uh, some techniques and they're getting pretty good hits. And that was, that was good because not a lot of them had shot a mover and we were shooting, what was that? A uh, 66% IPSC, Matt? Remember that was a 66 Yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it was, was not a fucking full on, you know, it wasn't even what you're normally seeing with movers, which is a full, what 40 millimeter or excuse me, 40 inch, uh, tall skinny. Um, so yeah, it was, it gave him a little bit of confidence being able to hit that. What was it? 44%. So it was a yeah, tiny fuck. It, it, it was a 66% IPSC. So it's, uh, it was not that big. And at 680, it's, it's pretty small. So the guys are having, having to do their, their fundamentals and, and stay on target, which is key for becoming a better shooter. And that's what this is uh, part of my L rock is about is getting these guys out there, these young kids and showing them, Hey, shooting a full iron maiden 
it's great and everything, but you have to shoot smaller targets to get better. And we shot, and then we, during the comp, we, we trained on Friday, we trained them up on Friday, we shot more movers, shot more targets. We uh, did some pistol drills. Matt helped out with the pistol. Uh, James Gill, who is a Leopold shooter and also a former Marine uh, who used to be on the, on the action on the action pistol and uh, rifle team for the Marine Corps, came out and helped train the helped train the soldiers. Because the average soldier is given an eye mill because he's a sniper, but never gets to shoot it, and doesn't have any fundamentals or any idea about his grip, about how to present the weapon, any of that stuff. Because they're not they're not taught it. I mean, who knows? In the average infantry, you know, basic infantry ground forces, conventional ground forces. Not many people are, are very, very good at shooting pistols because we're not taught to shoot a pistol. We don't, we don't shoot pistols. We don't get ammo for pistols. So Gil and Meckley worked with them and uh, got them semi-proficient. And when it came time during the competition the next day, they performed okay and they got through the pistol stage without getting too many negative points. Uh, kicked off on Saturday. Had a bunch of guys out. Kicked off. Uh, we shot the stages. Had a few delays, but, you know, that's... That's that's life. Uh, I think it went pretty well. Matt had a nice stage. Had three targets. Well, how, where were your targets at, Matt? Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that the through. I'd say out of how many teams did we have come out? Twenty six. So out of twenty six teams, I think only four teams actually identified the second target in the array from left to right. Um, so there was a one target at 930, and then you had another target um, about 25 degrees to the right. That was 300 meters. And then you had another target in the middle. Uh, fucking, we called it the Phantom, because, like, everybody was missing that. Um, and it was, it, was on, it was on ground. It looked like it was hanging in the trees. Um, but it was about 500-ish meters away. And uh, the, the, the problem with it, it was, it was sitting basically on the actual, the actual military ridge line uh, of that, that rise. And your eyes play trick with, tricks with you. So they, the, the, the whole point that Terrell was trying to, to promote was get guys to think, because they would stand up, go, I can, the team that did actually fucking find it, and it was bright orange, so it wasn't terribly difficult to find. Well, uh, he, I actually found... I actually had trouble finding it again after I <laughs> took eyes off of it. <laughs> I'd have Terrell come down and point it out to me and me and Rob. But uh, no, we the the whole point of the stage was to get guys to think outside of the okay. I'm going to lay down in the prone and fucking shoot this. They're, it's trying to promote a response of well, I can see it from the standing or the 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 sitting, but I can't see it from the prone. And a lot of guys. I think only one of them actually tried to shoot it. Um, just, you know, said, fuck it, got into a, a hasty kneeling, took the shot, actually dropped a fucking branch that made it easier for everybody after him to, to shoot. Um, but the, uh, there was one team that was dialed in on it, you know, like as far as, you know, sit, getting in the sitting, cause you can hit that one from the sitting, you can hit the 300 meter, 300 meter from the sitting and then take the gun out of the, the cradle and go prone for the nine thirty. Um, so it's, the, the whole point was to get guys out of the the mindset of I'm just going to lay down in this nice comfy little fucking spot full of cow pies and shoot, you know, these targets from the prone. Um, and it was, it was kind of staggering to see a lot of people flounder uh, when it came to that. It's a great stage though. Great stage. We watched a lot of rounds, a lot of trace. Um, and it was actually kind of a, it was educational for me too. And and that's the purpose of what I'm trying to do with uh, with El Rock, is to get guys to get out of their comfort zone, get out of their I'm going to shoot everything from the prone. Because in real life, you don't get to shoot everything from the prone. You don't get you don't get to say, oh, I'm going to lay down right now and get nice and fat and comfortable, and get my and get my my shooting mat out, and get comfortable and sling up and maybe get get these bipod legs adjusted exactly right. No, you got to maybe go off your pack or uh, go off a, a tripod, or go off a rock or, or go off a whatever you off a fence post, whatever you have available to get in your position and be able to engage and make these shots. 
And so I don't, the only time during my, my shoot that anyone had to shoot off anything that wasn't natural was during the carbine stage when I had a barricade there for him just to make him shoot off of something. Uh, other than that, everything they had was natural terrain. So we'll get the natural terrain in, in a way, hey, you can shoot off the ground, but it's probably better if you shoot off this pile of rocks because you can probably see it better. So make the guys make some decisions about how they want to shoot, what they want to do, actually find the targets. I gave everybody asthma to the targets, and there's a great misconception that I have GPS, I don't need a compass anymore. Uh, that is a, a thing that I see it's, it's reared its head is, I have a GPS, I don't need a compass. I'll just use my GPS everywhere I go. Well, guess what? GPS doesn't always work. And you should probably need to, need to know how to use a map and compass because everyone's given a map and a compass and azimuth to all the targets. So they were put under pressure on their time to get it completed. Each stage had about eight minutes to complete a stage. Some stages had four targets, some had three targets. Uh, very few of the targets were shot from a prone. I think only a couple of the stages where you're able to shoot from a prone. Most of them you're from a, a sitting position, a kneeling position, uh, off the top of your tripod if you brought one, or maybe your shooting sticks if you brought them. Whatever you had to figure out to shoot at an elevated, that's what you had to do. Matt, questions? I do have questions. What was the closest distance, the furthest distance, and the average round count? The closest distance was, let's see, well, not pistol, not kind of pistol or carbine, was about 315 meters. And that's on a, that was on a, actually 200, 200, 225 meters on a 5x5 uh, five five plate. So something about this big. But that's a guy, that's the size of a guy's head popping around a corner looking at you or trying to engage you. So you have to be able to hit that. And a lot of the guys haven't trained to that level and now they've experienced it. Now they need to go, need to know where they need to go. Uh, farthest distance was, uh, 1100 meters. The average, the round, uh, round count was 175 rounds for both days total. And were more people using gas guns or bolt guns? Bolt guns. Uh, most of the guys are very proficient with a bolt gun. They can run it pretty fast. Uh, a lot of them have 10-round mags. They're shooting a 6.5 of some sort. Uh, the Army guys showed up with their, with their M110s, and they're, they also showed up with uh, their 2010s shooting a 300 wind mag. The 300 wind mag is awesome for at distance, but once again, you have to know how to maneuver it and get it in position because it's a long heavy rifle and you have a can on the end of it. It's, it's a big rifle. You have to be able to muscle it around, get in position and then get somewhere where you can shoot it and be comfortable shooting it. And a lot of guys weren't used to, Hey, I'm not going to be in a prone because all of a sudden they were like, wow, I wish I had something a little bit more comfortable than this thing. Cause it's heavy. What was the latest? What was the you latest guys were Say again. What was the latest you guys were shooting? Uh, we shot until probably about about six o'clock at night, or right at right at the edge of darkness. We we called it. Next year I'm going to have a uh, a night shoot. I got some friends in the night vision industry uh, from DRS and Fleur. We're gonna come out with their latest latest stuff and uh, just do a night shoot as well. Do uh, give the military guys who guys who haven't seen a duns or fl or hisses or anything like that or I not block threes get an opportunity to shoot that stuff, get familiar with it. So when they do fall in on it, they've already seen it before and they know how to use it. And how many years have you been doing this? Uh, this, is, this is my third year. Believe it or not, third year already. Uh, it happens real fast. It's just me and, and, a, and a couple guys from uh, the Colville Mafia up, up there to put it on. And uh, guys like Matt come out and help and Rob Winter, another PNS guy. Uh, it was great to have those guys out because, you know, without those guys, the ROs helping out, you know, it wouldn't happen. It had great sponsors, you know, sponsors from all over the country, you know, guys from 
Otis, they sent me some cleaning gear and some and some some cash to get it going. I mean, I had to I had to put uh, diesel fuel in a caterpillar to plow the roads three weeks before because there's four feet of snow on the ground at the time. You know, when we shot it, there was no barely any snow on the ground, but targets just don't grow on grow in place on themselves. So we had to put all these targets in place, which meant you know out there for a week, you know putting targets in place. And carrying steel, moving it around, getting an idea, making sure all the range fans didn't overlap, make sure they're all nice and clear, make sure if you shot on stage five that you wouldn't be hitting guys on stage four, you know. So it's a it's a it's kind of a pain in the butt, but the satisfaction of seeing those young kids getting better at their at their job. You know, this is this is their job. They're gonna when they get better at their job, so when they did they deploy Maybe they got a chance of, of, of doing their job better and, and killing the bad guys, and, and that's what I do it for. Plus, uh, it's kind of nice. The guys who won, uh, one of them was a former a former tanker in the army, and the other one was a paratrooper uh, and sniper way back in the dark ages in the 70s and in, in the 82nd, and he can still sing the 82nd songs to this day. And uh, it was it was motivating to see guys, you know, guys 60 years old, and He's the best shooter out there right now. And his team is the best shooter out there. And that, that's pretty motivating to see a guy doing that and showing the young kids up like, hey, look, you know, you've got to have the skills. You know, you can be strong all you want, but if you if you get there and you don't know what you're doing, it doesn't help you any. So that was motivating to see, you know, Clinton and Mike do well. That's pretty cool. Yeah, they, they straight fucking slayed a lot of those stages. Not my, not not the last stage though. Um, that was no. pretty funny. <laughs> Clint uh, Clint Clint threw some stuff. Um, but uh, no, it was it was really heartening to see, and you could you could off the bat tell the difference between the guys that were trained and worked with each other for a while. Um, and had kind of a, you know, they didn't have to talk about shit. They, they knew what the fuck they were doing. You know, they knew their priorities of work. Um, and that's something I stressed to a lot of the guys that I saw fucking fall apart on a few stages on, on time or, you know, just not, not, not cause I, it's weird. Cause sections kind of operate in, in, in a weird range from the normal infantry. I mean, you guys probably would fucking guys that are from the Marine Corps 0311 community or the Army 11 Bravo community or even the 19 Delta community. Hi, Bill. Um, they, you start calling people by their first names at work and fucking, you know, um, but it, it really does help when you guys are very, very dialed in. Like you hang out with each other, you, your friends out, outside of work. Um, and you can see the guys that have worked with each other for a long period of time, went to school with each other. So they've got their, their communications pretty minimal, but it's, it's one, one or two words speaks, you know, for an entire sentence. And, uh, I could tell the difference without even knowing who had gone to school and who hadn't. Um, there, there were some, some guys that were very enamored with the, the gear side of things. Um, <laughs> yeah. and you know, the, the new fucking hotness, but they didn't know how to manipulate it. Um, they, they hadn't been to school yet. So it was all about the, the new fangled, um, the new fangled, uh, weapons and, you know, optics and all this other shit. Like I had to break out my fucking kit and luckily I had owned this optic in the past. Um, but I had to fix a guy's fucking night force piece that he had no idea how to use, but you know what? It's the new fucking hotness, you know? So they were very enamored with the gear and the, you know, running the fucking cool guy rifle, not enamored with, with rolling. And I even told all, all of them, like, look, you need to be, cause I saw a lot of the breakdowns of, I'd watch them, you know, guy spotting for a fucking dude shooting a 110 and then a guy spotting for a dude shooting a 2010. That's a 300 win mag and an M110 is a 7.62. Um, so I'd, I'd watch shooter spotter, which is an awesome doctrine if you know what the fuck you're doing and you have your buddy's dope on an arm board ready to go. Um, I'd watch them call wind, wind, uh, wind calls that were solidly 300 wind mag wind calls and not 
762 win calls that the guy's actually shooting. So that they'd fuck over their teammate, you know, by inch, trying to inch it in instead uh, when they could have made a bold call and gotten a hit. Um, it's they. I, I think the the 2010 is an excellent excellent tool um just raising hit probability the problem is is a lot of those guys were getting very sucked into the the easy easy fucking hit uh the easy platform uh three and a win mag's awesome until that 900 round barrel is toast and then you back to the the 110 so um long story short um the guys guys needed to be more dialed in on the issued equipment and less so with the uh, the new awesome sauce simply because that's what not what they're going to get issued um, that's not where they have their disposal so you know run, run what you brown especially when it's issued uh, optics is a little bit flexible but again know what the fuck you're buying because uh, a lot of those guys had no idea you know how to manipulate even the the, the basic optics beyond what they're issues. I kind of got off track, but yeah. But no, that, that was Matt a hundred percent right there. Uh, we saw guys who knew how to do their stuff and they knew their equipment. they have been to school. They've been to sniper school. They'd spent the time, they understand what they're doing. And then guys who had just gotten a section, they are enamored in the fact that, hey, I'm in a sniper section. I'm, I'm cool now. And the cool guy stuff wears off. Hopefully it wears off. And they get down to work. And I think this was a good eye-opener eye for them to see that, hey, wait a minute. There's a lot of stuff I need to learn. I need to learn it right now. Even cooler was at the end of the competition when I'm handing out prizes, and there's things like uh, little Paul – Mark, Mark sticks three to eight teams on, 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 on the prize table. The top three teams gave up their prizes to the Army kids. They said, hey, look, Army kid, come up there. I know you don't, you're don't. you starting out. Why don't you go get that rifle scope so you can build a good rifle underneath it? Hey, why don't you go get that other rifle scope? Why don't you go get that new barrel? Why don't you get that, you know, companies like McMillan donated two uh, McMillan stocks Four hundred dollars off a of McMillan stock and with a military discount now that's free. So two McMillan stocks to a team, uh, a benchmark barrel, loop pull rifle scopes. Uh, see, just a bunch of stuff. So every single military team had a start of a weapon for them to build a rifle so they can they can learn how to shoot it and they can continue this outside their work. So that was pretty cool watching those those top teams. You know. It's a lot to ask a guy to give up, you know, $2,500 rifle scope, and he gives it away to a kid he doesn't even know. That's pretty cool. Matt. Prime? Yeah, I mean, the, the hardest part is, uh, or are you talking Prime? Yeah. Or whoever. Well, uh, we do have an additional question, um, if there's nothing more on on that. Sure. Go sure. for it. Go for it. In the words uh, of Roland, I got nothing. Uh, so is the 308 still relevant? Uh, question mark. With 506 getting better every year, ammo and optics, and the 260 6.5 Creedmoor on the scene, is there still a place for the M110K, i.e. CSAS? Uh, yes, I'll answer this. Right now, the Marine Corps has 11 million rounds of Alpha Alpha 11. Now, it's not counting the rounds of, that's basically 118 LR is Alpha Alpha 11 Dodak. Not counting the, the rounds they already have built of AB39, which is the improved temperature-sensitive ammo as well. So, yeah, there's a need for 308 because it's all, we already have it. You can't just say, oh, okay, we're not going to do 308 anymore. We're going to go to a 6.5. And, well, the good thing about 308 is the barrels last forever. I mean, basically forever. I, I, I can think of of all the uh, M24s that I had at a schoolhouse and M110s. I mean, I had 60 M24s and 75 M110s. I don't think we ever wore, wore out barrels in them. Maybe the M110s now, are, they're starting to replace barrels. But the 24s, a bolt action gun, we never, we never, we never broke them. They just kept on going forever and ever. And for a training rifle... 
it's what you want. You want a rifle that you can shoot repeatedly over and over and over without it having a degradation of accuracy. You want a rifle that you can take to the range, you know it's going to perform the same way every single time. So you can put all these kids through it and make sure you get them trained on it. So the 308, if you can shoot a 308 at distance, you can shoot everything else. It makes the three in a wind mag, makes it easier. The, the problem is these kids, they get a, they shoot a three in a wind mag because it's, it's a lot easier to shoot when it calls, when, when your wind calls and your, and your everything else, it's, it's half of what your 308 is. The problem is your barrel life is for crap. So now you just burn out your barrel and you got to send it away and you don't know when you can get it back. And there was a bunch of other issues with that. So yeah, the 308 is definitely a viable system because if you can shoot a 308, you can shoot anything else out there. You can shoot the 260, you can shoot the 65, 243, uh, what else is out there? And right now, uh, I'm thinking the only Dodex we have, I believe, uh, we have Dodex for 301 meg, two different Dodex. We have the 190 grain and the 220 grain. We have one Dodex for the 338 that just finally came on board. And we have a couple for the 762. Uh, 260 is a great round. Uh, first, you know, silhouette shooters brought into existence because they needed a round that had enough power to knock down plates, but not so much power to wear them out. So 260 is a great round, but do we have a Dodak for it right now? Can I pull it up in the system on a computer and say Dodak for 260? Until we have a Dodak for 260, we can't even think about having 260 rounds. Got to build the ammo first and then get the rifle to it. So the M110, uh, you know, the CSAS, when it finally comes out, it was supposed to be announced like two months ago. So, Mikey, you better get on it. Uh, I'd like to see what it's going to be. I'm very interested. I know the four the four outbreaks of it. I'm interested to see what, it, what it's going to be. Because uh, hopefully it's going to be a much better rifle than we had with the 110. I mean, the 110, it still works, but we need some upgrades. We need a better, a shorter we need a better stock. We need a better scope. A bunch of different things. So, yes, the 308 is still a viable round. And I'd like to add that I've made some remarks uh, in the forum in general um, with regard to 308 and it, it, its efficacy uh, as far as the the uh, you know my my context and I guess that's on me because I didn't add the context of I'm a civilian shooter as it stands right now I still shoot 308 for work out of a you know in the wind door however comma um, for my personal uses meaning you know basically, basically competition uses and or hunting um, and, and then on the, the realm of like the fringe fringe paranoid fucking delusion that the entire world is going to go completely tits up and I'm going to have to start, start stacking bodies. Um, the, the, the 308 itself, me, me right, now, right now, in that very specific context, is, uh, is, is very difficult for me to justify. It means that I don't want to put in my, my collection of uh, 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 possible problems, problems to solve. solve. Um, uh, but it, but it me for me personally, personally especially with limited you know, narrow, narrow funds, uh, I, find I find that, that I can do most, most things that I create with five, 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 six. Hey, uh, uh, Mickley, all right, sorry to interrupt you, man, but uh, you know a lot of feedback and, uh, and, uh, and interference to take off your mic. I don't know if anyone else is hearing that. Really? Really? Uh, uh, is, it, is it any better? better? Still bad? Still bad? Still bad. Yeah, same thing. We, uh, we take a I'm gonna close some some, some windows and I'll see my bandwidth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Better, better, worse, worse. Same, same. Uh, I'll, I'll, I got, I got, I can, I can. My just my connection. I know they're another watching Netflix downstairs. There's a, so are we? Are we? Be right back. Right back. Yeah, since Wayne Bear's gone, I guess I gotta play broadcast engineer.
Better? Worse? You're good. Okay. Uh, to turn what I was saying before, uh, for those who didn't catch it, uh, my way of editing, uh, is essentially uh, I made some offhand remarks as far as 308. Uh, respect to I, I can't justify 308 in you know, common. I didn't add the context of in my specific role right now as a civilian, um, I can do the, pretty much everything that I would expect 308 to do within 400 meters with a 5.56 gun. Um, and I, it's hard for me with limited funds and limited ammo, you know, vectors to justify a 308, um, especially in a SAS. Doesn't mean I don't want one, um, but, you know, dropping three grand on a semi automatic sniper system, whether it be the, the SCAR, whether it be the OBR, et cetera, et cetera, um, is, is kind of tough right now. And I had an OBR, um, but replacing it's fucking expensive. So I see another one here. Um, somebody's asking about uh, the use of slings uh, for using it for increasing accuracy. So I guess uh, using it for stabilization. Um, from the perspective of uh, patrol guys who maybe haven't thought of using it that way or maybe weren't taught uh, to use it that way. So um, obviously that's probably something that uh, that you guys do a lot of, Mac Lee Terrell, but um, maybe... Uh, I don't know if, if Bill or anyone else has uh, any thoughts about that from a patrol standpoint. You know, we, we, uh, we teach them that um, as part of the initial um, training of it. Um, you know, our guns are, are uh, set up with two-point slings. They have either the uh, Blue Force gear or the uh, VTAC sling on them. Um, so we show it to them. But, uh, you know, most police engagements are, are, are really goddamn short. And uh, so most guys forget about it. I mean, Helen, uh, in Roland's class recently, uh, good refresher on that. And, uh, and all the SWAT guys from my team that were in the class were like, fuck man, we need to probably practice this a little bit more. And they're right. Um, but we, I mean, we, honestly, we just don't shoot at distance as much as I'd like to, uh, partly because of range availability is a pain in the ass, uh, to get longer range distances. And then, uh, and then when we do get those distances, it's typically just checking the gun and the bullets. It's not really, you know, like shooting from unconventional positions or shooting uh, offhand using the sling, uh, we usually got some kind of support uh, if we're going to be making those kind of long range shots. So, I, at least in my experience in this area, not many guys are well versed in it, and they certainly don't practice it very much. But, uh, but probably the biggest reason is because the shots don't call for it in most cases. Shocking. Roland, you guys got any thoughts on it? Uh, sling usage. Uh, yeah, it's something that we've started to incorporate more. Um, sorry, got a nice things going on here. Um, incorporate more. I kind of cover it when I talk about barrel harmonics and bracing off of barricades with barrels and how it can affect shots at distance and stuff like that and kind of uh, covering it for shots 50 yards and out, kind of finding impromptu ways to um, brace the rail off of hard objects, whether it be like a support brace for a um, canopy cover or um, a 90 degree angle. And uh, I've had quite a bit of success with kind of the hasty, um, you know, tensioning of the sling to stabilize that rifle. So uh, I've only been doing it honestly for about six months now, but uh it's been really good, and uh, we're going to keep kind of pushing it pretty hard for guys. But I think kind of, too, that it's uh, important to cover the barrel harmonics because especially with guys that are using rifles with 7-inch drop-in rails that have got a whole shitload of barrel exposed, you see it sometimes where um, the offset of the barricade or whatever they're shooting off of, they'll brace the barrel off of it. And, uh, I mean, typically you got to put a lot of pressure on that barrel, to influence a deviation in that shot, but it's still a good habit to get guys to get the barrel off of the object that they're bracing off of. So, uh, 
uh, for are you, are you talking precision rifle slings or are we talking just slings in general? Uh, so the, the, the context of the question was uh, in reference to tax slings and patrol use. So I'm going to, I'm going to guess that's not necessarily specifically aimed at precision rifle, but I think there might be some crossover over there. Um, I, I would say the, the two point adjustables are probably the most versatile thing you can buy. Um, I think I, I don't, I'm kind of reading into the context here, but the, the one points fucking suck, man. Like, uh, if for general, especially when you're applying it to an LE side of things, like it, one point's awesome if you're grabbing the rifle, running and gunning and doing all sorts of other, you know, highly dynamic moving shit where you're not actually having to sling the rifle and just stand there. Um, and unfortunately, they also kind of limit you on using the sling to your advantage, uh, like like Shockey was saying, where it's use, using the sling to actually brace against barriers. Um, the, man... I, like two point adjustable has pretty much become the, the 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 standard, you know, as far as how I judge everything. Uh, I've tried the the single point, and you just end up with a rifle in your dick, like nine times out of ten. So you guys are talking about uh, just tightening it up around your around your body, like if you had a rifle slung, or are you actually talking about like old school fucking like loop sling shit? Uh, you can do all of that, and then you can also you, you can do the the old school fucking rifleman techniques, um, and then you can also use that sling, you know, grabbing a fist of it and pressing that fist into a a barricade, or grabbing the sling and pinning it against that barricade, putting a little bit of body weight behind it, and actually using it as a uh, a brace. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can manipulate that thing that you just can't do with any one point at all. Yeah. And, and to hit on that, everything that we teach is based on two points, but I mean, a lot of, of your ability to do that is, is dictated on time and urgency of the shot. But I mean, something as simple as a, a pull or a street light, you know, taking that, extending the slack on a two point all the way out and simply wrapping the sling one time around that pull and then cinching it down with your support hand, butting that rifle up with a shield of tension against that light pull can remove all of the wobble you know i mean it's not something that i would encourage guys to do at 25 maybe even 35 but when you start getting back to 50 75 you know if you're still going to be in a prone or you're still going to be in a standing position prone is not available you don't want to go to prone take a knee whatever the case may be um bracing off of something with the sling a two point might i add a one point it, the, the the angle in which it pulls in the rifle, it doesn't equally pull on, on the front and the back, so it's not advantageous. Um, pretty much a lot of it is two points only. Uh, I would like to add a caveat to what um, Shockey's saying. Uh, as far as the, the, the wrenching in um, and, you know, doing the classic fucking over-under forearm wrap that you see or, or bicep wrap, that you see a lot of guys using in the that that sense, even even bracing against a barricade, you know, using that two point to cam into that gun. Um, be aware of your 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 platform that you're using. If you're using a straight up, you know, basically six nine twenty issued M4 with non free float, you know, and, and the, you know the rail isn't fucking stiff. Um, be very aware that you can induce POI shift. Um, by camming into that thing, you will actually change the point of impact of the barrel um, by putting sling tension on there. Um, there's plenty of documentation with the Marine Corps and the Army marksmanship units doing that exact thing or having it down to where they can cam into that thing every single time the same way. And that's not applicable at all for, for that kind of like LE patrol context. Um, one other thing I would also like to add is the the sling itself, um, if you look at the deployment time, single points, I'd say, are uh, a pain in the dick because you can't stuff it. You can't keep it on the rifle, you know, wrapped up around the stock with a rubber band or whatever um, sitting in your rack easily. You, if, the only way you can deploy that quickly is you've already have it on. Um, 
for for two points you can grab the rifle off the rack it's not going to get in the way if you wrap it correctly and you have it there when you need it to play and all it takes is pulling it out throwing it over your head um so deployment times cut down as well um yeah that's all i got so it's a good that's kind of good uh because there's additional considerations other than just putting the shit on your rifle and then uh you know using it to hang off your body or stabilize a shot or something like that so in storage and employment considerations. Uh, I think is, is pretty much everybody just doing the S fold rubber band thing, or, or, or what are we seeing? I use shock cord. Put a shock cord around the the butt stock, and then just stuff the sling up there and stick it right next to my leg. Yeah, most of our guys are just rubber bands. They're right there in the fucking supply cabinets. When you grab your new pens and shit, just grab a few rubber bands, um, and it works fine. Same thing. Rubber bands. Yep, rubber bands. There's also specific ones you can get. SOB has one. There's several guys that have them out there, but, I mean, if you want to pay the money for it, you can. Otherwise, you can just use... Um, Thicker, heavier, do your rubber bands, and they'll do the job. Yeah, you probably get like a sack of like a hundred like riggers bands or something off of Amazon or some shit, which would be probably preferable to your admin whiskey locker rubber bands. There's a good question that just popped up for old Bill. The question word asks, if he were a Twinkie, what would you fill him with? Strange. The sky's the limit. Prime, you want to read that question and let Bill shed some insight or Mackley or... You mean the one that's posted to the Facebook group and actually should be on the forum so we can keep track of these? Uh, I don't know what question you're talking about then. Uh, whoever that is, on. fuck yourself. That's right. You know, I think this might be the same question that's been coming up frequently, and this is finally the right panel to, to talk about it. The PT one? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Senior... Shock. For guys who want to get in shape for some form of combat arms, what is a good physical fitness program to get into? What are sp some specific workouts that one should do? Thoughts on Thor 3. Bill, clearly this goes to you. You're 106 and you look like you're only 70, so it's amazing. It's, it's, it's fucking, it, the question is so goddamn broad, it's hard to answer. What, what do, I mean, what do, you want to go into combat arms, what does that, I mean, is there an entrance test? Is there something that you have to pass in order to, to even get into whatever the kid is you're trying to do? You know what I'm saying? I got one for you then. To get on your SWAT team, what should some what should someone start doing? Um, PT? So Let's just say average, average person, they don't need to lose a ton of weight. <clears throat> Well, so our test is pretty fucking gay, um, it, it, and it's the typical shit, right? It's again, sit-ups, push-ups, pull-ups, and, and a, a mile-and-a-half run, pretty typical law enforcement stuff. Um, so to get on the team, uh, you got to do 35 push-ups, 35 sit-ups, you got to do six pull-ups, and you got to run a mile-and-a-half in 12.30 or better. So if you can't do that, and all of, the, all of that is coming um, with no breaks, right? You're going to do each of those events one after the other, um, and the order of the events is a random drawing. Uh, we don't, you know, it's you got to be able to do it in any specific or no specific order. It's going to be random. So um, you got to obviously push yourself um, to those to those fucking deals and be able to pass it all um, in one shot. So that that's the entrance exam. Uh, so to that gets you on the team to stay on the team. Um, well, you know, if you want to make entry into houses or if you would be happy just driving the fucking Bearcat for the rest of your career or being the videotape guy in the passenger seat, uh, then that's all you got to do. Uh, if you want to get in the house, then you got to do 50, 50, 10 and 1130. Um, 
it's, that's just kind of the uh, the deal, right? So if you can't do that, you ain't making entry. Um, and there have been guys that are clearly very qualified dudes um, that fail to meet that standard, and then they are pulled off the entry stick. And uh, you know, they're, they're, the argument is, well, you're losing some of that experience for a guy that can do a couple push-ups. And what I have noticed over almost 21 years in SWAT now is when guys start to have their PT fall off, uh, it's uh, it's almost a subliminal message to me that um, that they're no longer interested in the team. If that makes sense, their dedication is waning, their commitment is waning, and so it manifests itself in shitty PT. In some guys and other guys, it manifests itself in shitty pistol shooting. They let that start to slip, but it's just little clues. So, uh, you know, the the that the, the testing go ahead sorry bill on that topic though um so keeping sustainment what do you recommend for sustainment for pt <laughs> like what you do in your your, your everyday life well, so i mean shit has changed over the years obviously right? i'm uh, being almost 50 fucking years old at this point i mean i used to try to lift heavy right on to lift volkswagens throw motherfuckers out windows and you know, tear phone books in half and shit like that. And then you get two knee surgeries and you get a fucking reconstruction on your shoulder and you get a bunch of nagging pain uh, as you get older. You just kind of have to adjust a little bit. And there was a, uh, you know, there's a time period where I, I, I made a mistake and I quit doing Olympic lifting, um, being concerned about uh, some of the joint pain I was getting, um, pre-existing injuries. And, uh, and I think I, sh- I wish I would not have stopped. So I probably the last three years started doing some Olympic lifting again. And, uh, and what I've done is just gotten smarter about it. So instead of trying to lift the fucking gym, I'm doing Olympic lifting um, with a focus on form and not worrying so much about what's on the bar. Um, but I think you got to do all that shit. You know, really, uh, it, depending on what you're trying. My son, you know, joined the Navy. He was trying to get in SWIC. And, uh, and so to, to hit that, you know, he's like, well, fuck, you know, you got to do whatever the fuck, 112 fucking push-ups to be considered and all this kind of shit. How, what do I do, Dad, to, to get those push-ups up? And I was like, yeah, man, you want to get good at push-ups? Guess what the fucking answer is? Do some fucking push-ups, right? Every chance you get, do some goddamn push-ups. Um, it, a lot of times, I, you know, what, what should I do? What should I do? Man, do fucking anything. Get your ass off the fucking couch <clears throat> and go do some shit, and that's probably going to be sufficient to get you into the entrance level of most things. Now, obviously, top-tier guys, um, you know, a little bit tougher of a standard. <clears throat> what I always tell guys, though, man, is don't be happy with that fucking minimum, right? As a young dude, you want to push yourself way past what most people would consider extreme so that as you get older, you're going to slow down. You're going to be able to do less. Um, but you started at such a high uh, level that you're still performing probably uh, much better than, than most dudes. So uh, Pat Mack's book is really good. If you guys haven't read Combat Strength Training, um, he does a really good job of detailing shit out. Uh, been to his class, um, and, and I, again, he does a great job. Um, you know, guys, what the fuck, 52 something years old, um, and, and, and the, you know, the guys are obviously in very good fucking shape. Uh, but his whole mantra of staying stronger, longer, sustainment training, um, that, you know, he mixes shit up. Uh, so you got a heavy day, you got an athletic day, you got an anaerobic day, aerobic day, all that kind of shit. Um, and you just mix it up. And I, I think that's probably the most critical thing for guys is it should be job specific. Um, you know, some of these big fucking freight trains uh, that come on the team, uh, you know, they, they're they're kind of short spurt dudes, man. They, they, you know, big Great Danes and they and they burn out pretty fucking quick because they're, they, you know, their body can't sustain it. Same thing with the little guys uh, doing lifting heavy shit and carrying heavy shit on a, on a 110 pound ladies frame, even though you got a dick swinging, um, takes its toll. So you got to be somewhere in the middle. I think to sustain a career, if it's something you want to do, but I, you know, probably shock like your team, right? I get guys that come on, they, you know, they're looking for a resume check or they want to put a feather in the cap uh, and they're gone in five years. So that, that lengthy PT piece um, isn't that important to them. Uh, and so, you know, they, they come on, they, they work out a little bit and, and then they drive the fuck on. So, but I, I mean, you know, I, I'm no fitness fucking guru, man. I don't have any kind of degree or any of that bullshit um, to go along with it. You know, I could probably eat better. I should, at my age, probably should take a fucking multivitamin or some goddamn thing. Who the fuck knows? Um, but I just try to get after it every day, man. I try to get a, get a sweat going every fucking day doing something. Um, and, and I think that has, you know, helped sustain you over the over the course of a career. So I don't know if that's good advice or, or what. You want you want a good program, man, read, read CST. I think Pat details are pretty nice in his book. Hey, Roland, did you hear the question? Are we still on the PT? Yes. Any pointers or anything you've seen that's been overly uh, successful? 
uh, your your multifunctional fitness uh, see, seems to seems to to do really well. Uh, guys, guys that do um, just isolated strength training, uh, I think they're kind of doing themselves a, a, a disservice. Uh, you know, your traditional, you know, muscle head bodybuilding style lifting because um, you you got to have your body working together, uh, the, ver the various parts of it. And, and so um, you know, multifunction fitness when you're doing uh, kind of cross training style um, workouts uh, those are very efficient and they're very short duration. Um, so that, that th there's a place for that. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily like CrossFit itself because I think that, uh, that it, it's very injury prone. When, when you're doing Olympic lifts for time, uh, your chances of jacking yourself up if uh, you're fatigued and starting to cheat uh, on your form, unless you're really, really disciplined, uh, and, and holding yourself accountable to, to your form, uh, your, your chances of getting out of form and hurting yourself uh, kind of increase. But um, um, you know, we had strength training coaches and, and everything, and they initially came in and kind of were were training us on a on a football model. Uh, but when they actually hooked us up to biometrics when we were doing training and they monitored our heart rate for the duration of an op. Uh, our biometric signatures were coming back showing that it was much more like a, a hockey player uh, physiologically than a football player. So it was, it was sustained high heart rate with uh, our sustained elevated heart rate with like these spikes of maximum heart rate, you know, maximum uh, exertion uh, and then and then going back down to the steady state of elevated heart rate um, so uh, that that's just you, you got to keep that in mind you got to be able to to lift this stuff lift yourself do these pull-ups do these things when your heart's beating when you're out of breath uh, you have to be able to you have to be able to perform strength in the middle of cardio basically is, is, is what you've got to be called on, uh, to, to, to perform and to operate. So I think there's absolutely a place if you're trying to build, uh, you know, build strength to do, you know, do your Olympic lifts to have your heavy, your heavy days. Um, but, uh, but you should, you should definitely, uh, get, get your, get your, uh, your cross training on as well. Um, obstacle courses are a really, really good cross training, uh, style event because you've got to pull, you got to push, you got to climb, um, you got to have grip strength. Uh, you know, when you're working ropes, uh, grip strength is huge. So, and grip strength transitions to, to better marksmanship. Uh, it's, a, there's an absolute correlation to being able to shoot a handgun well and, uh, and having good, uh, grip strength. So. Um, working, uh, working, you know, ropes. Uh, if, you, if you have a rope in your gym, um, doing rope climbs with elevated vest uh, or uh, weighted vest is uh, is absolutely um, good and viable uh, training uh, training thing as well. Yeah, I think I think Roland's man I, to the to the dude asking the question, man. We'll figure out what are the what are the parameters of the unit, whatever it is that he's trying to do, and then I would say work on those specific events and and work toward workouts, um, you know, that are going to allow you to perform better in those specific deals. And then once he's in the unit that he's trying to get into, um, the man, yeah, you got you got you got to switch it up. And, a lot to be said for athleticism too, right? I mean, I think as young guys, we take some of that for uh, for granted. We're involved in athletics and doing sports and shit. Uh, but the hand and eye coordination, the fast twitch muscles, a lot of that, yeah, my, certainly in the, my army days where everything was based on cardio and push-up, sit-ups, that kind of thing. 
Um, but there, there's a, there's absolutely necessity for, to be able to, to get your sprint on when you need to and not look like a fucking old man. Um, you know, you, you just, you gotta be able to move quick and that's, uh, you know, so you, you gotta include some of that stuff, box jumps, um, doing some rapid step ups, so just wind sprints, um, you know, any of that kind of crap. I don't know, Meckley, what, what do you do, man? To stay in shape and, and, uh, and work. I know you're, you like lifting heavy, but you're still a pretty young guy. Are you uh, find any effect of that? Uh, with, <sighs> With fitness, um, I've you know gotten a little smarter uh, as I've progressed, um, and, and I second what Bill said about you know it, it, fitness in a lot of ways. I think a lot of guys they they apply it as a broad spectrum. You know, you must do you're training for a PT test, which is the way that the the army, at least from my experience, operates, because uh, that PT test translates into good NCOERs and good OERs. Full stop. Um, the reality is, <clears throat> is you need to uh, look at what your actual mission requirements are, and then tell your PT according to that. It might, it might not, it might fall in line with your PT test. It might not. Um, so you kind of have to be a little bit good at both. You, you gotta, you know, okay, I got a PT, PT test in a month. I need to tune myself up to get good at that. But you might have to switch up and after that PT test period is done, train for the, the myriad of tasks you have to do in that particular role. Um, so I started doing the, the CrossFit training stuff and that's kind of how I, you know, I went off the rabbit hole on uh, realizing that the PT training I was getting was subpar for the tasks I was being asked to, to do um, and kind of, you know, did my own digging. Um, I did a lot of stuff from Jim Jones uh, and his training and he fucking loves that goddamn row machine. Um, but, uh, and to second what Roland said, the, the CrossFit stuff's good. If you take it and tailor it to what you're doing. Uh, the problem with CrossFit is kind of like, uh, I, I liken it to bad firearms training. Um, e e humans learn based off repetition. And when you're doing a hundred fucking snatches at 115 and you around fucking rep 50, you start getting sloppy. Uh, you start imprinting bad repetitions and then guys wonder why they either hurt themselves or they can't really go heavier than what they should be able to do. Um, and that's partially because they've, they've imprinted a bunch of bad repetitions on that particular exercise. Um, so tailor what you, your tasks are, what you know you're expected to do, um, based off your, and then, and then tailor that to your physical training. Um, uh, military athletes are pretty good. I've done some of their, their cycles or their training programs. Um, they've gotten a lot better uh, with having very concise programs. And I, I, I tell guys, get on a fucking program and follow that program until it's natural progression uh, and keep track of stuff. You know, keep a log. You know, write down your, 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 your workout. Write down the weights you lifted that day. So you can actually, at the end of that 12 week cycle, um, put down those numbers and go, okay, I, I improved here, here, and here, but I also, you know, for the time for this wad or this workout of the day or whatever, uh, training cycle they use as a barometer for your performance, I did better or worse. And then start to correlate those cause and effects based on that. Uh, the biggest thing, though, it's like Met TC. You know, mission drives the gear train. It drives the PT train just as much. Uh, so you need to focus on your PT in relation to what your mission requirements are, um, uh, especially for infantry guys. You know, it's fucking walking. <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's it's like pull-ups. The only way you're going to get better at pull-ups is pull-ups. The only way you're going to get better with walking at weight is walking, but be smart about it. Um don't do what I did and, you know, completely screw your knee up. So you have to completely shift your PT schedule to something that is still getting it done, but, you know, it is not as uh, optimal for that, you know, for the stuff you, you're still doing. Cool. Anyone have anything further? I have a follow-on question or topic <clears throat> based on a previous discussion we had a couple days ago. We were discussing responding to active shooters. We were discussing how typically when officers arrive on scene, 
that's about the time that the active shooter decides to off themselves. Well, here's a nice little Police One article discussing doing a warning shot at your response. Yeah, I see Bill's face there. Yeah, yeah. So the idea is you do this warning shot, I guess, to let the bad guy know you're there and hopefully that will instigate him to commit suicide? Yeah. It's silly. Okay, so we have this. We have this. It's it's on Police One. And then we had that other article about not, what was the basically point shooting in another did you read the police one article? Because I no, I don't want to. Well, I, I'm, yeah, I, I have... well, I'm curious. Is, is that is that really what it says, or is that yes, an interpretation of something? No, that's actually basically, what it said. Yeah. basically, it took um, the example, and what they did is they capitalized on Sandy Hook as one of their primary examples, and pointed out that the shooter committed suicide before officers even made entry into the school. And what they, again, what they theorized, because they don't know for sure because the dude is dead, is that he actually fired rounds at the officers. They didn't know it until the fall of investigation. And while he's doing it, the sling that he had breaks. So in their infinite wisdom, they believe that he thought that the officers were returning fire a round pierced his sling in his mind so he <laughs> offed himself. And so they thought that if homeboy rolls up, gets out, fucking pops straight in the fucking asphalt parking lot, he's going to smoke it right there before they have run in. So that was kind of um, the synopsis of that article, as as painful as it was to read. So what we have is we have that. Let's see here. That is on, that's on Police One. Okay, that's a, fairly large publication. We also have the Front Sight Lie article on Law Officer. What the hell is going on? How is this stuff getting through? And do they realize this is influencing decision makers? This is influencing police officers. This is influencing responsible citizens. Well, maybe not responsible if they read this and, and follow it. What do you guys think? It To me, it's disgusting. Oh, Bill, go ahead. Whoa, whoa. Oh. What, the, what the fuck? Yes. With, the, with the first part. I mean, what, what, are you, what the fuck are you talking about? I mean, that is the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard in my entire life. I, I, I can't believe, I mean, I guess I can believe somebody would write that. But who the fuck lets that get published anywhere? Who, does it say the motherfucker's name? Spit his name out. What's this cocksucker's okay. name? Uh, I believe he John was. Stanley. Yeah, I believe John. he was a retired uh, Los Angeles Sheriff's Department lieutenant, I believe. When, when the motherfucker retired, 1970? No, recently. Like, uh, still, still, like, just, you know. So if that is the case, right, if I if I roll up and, and bust a cap into the ground, why won't my police siren make the guy kill himself as I'm responding to this bitch? That's a fine question. Right? I mean, he knows I'm coming. He hears the siren. So how is that? That is the dumbest shit I've ever heard. I don't even know what this front, with the myth of the front sight, whatever the hell you're talking about, a law officer. If anybody read that Police One article, that's just fucking stupid. You're a moron if you think that's a good idea. You're just you're just dumbass. And that guy's well, a dumbass. There's a correlation with this also. We have this type of material in mainstream law enforcement. And we also have all this derp. And they both seem to be accepted, and no one's calling it out. Well, so the problem, too, is is that, like, has anybody ever watched a fucking active shooter incident? Like, fucking people are running everywhere, and I'm just going to fucking sit around, <laughs> just skipping and bobbing across the fucking concrete parking lot. And, like, what happens if I get in there, and our fucking theme and topic is terrorism, and dudes want to get it on? Like, I might need those fucking three rounds that I just... <laughs> fucking slung into the pavement just to try and scare a bitch. Like, what are we playing fucking peekaboo with them? So, I mean, people are running everywhere. You have no accountability of the fucking rounds. You're wasting ammunition that you could use because the average cop, the average cop loadout, give or take, is 45 to 50 rounds. Like, it, I don't know. It's just fucking stupid. I mean, I, I guess I see where he's picking up the theory, but it's completely fucking stupid at the same time. Like, Bill makes a valid point. Like, if gunshots are going to do it, 
why wouldn't the fucking sound of the cavalry come in lights and sirens do the same effect? And like, I'm a big, big proponent of singleton response and active shooter. So the time that cop's taking the pop rounds in the fucking ground should be the time that he's running his ass across the parking lot to dart into that fucking school and stop a dude like the real fucking way, not like let me fucking pop some blanks off and hope the dude ends it for me. Like I don't have to go in there and do fucking bad things to him. It's a fucking stupid ideology. And I mean, I don't know. I think Police One is kind of one of those publications where they're getting too big for their own good and they're just letting anything and everything flow through it just to generate traffic. So, and uh, you know, if the dudes are dedicated, right? That's just. I mean, it's not somebody that's going to kill themselves. They they they're ready to slug it out. And now I'm going to give them a a signature that this is where I'm coming from. So a multiple group of dudes will go. Oh, okay, if Jackie and Blower has just arrived, they're out there in the parking lot shooting into the dirt. Let's go over that door and shoot their asses while they're busy fucking killing grass or whatever the fuck they're doing. I mean, that is the stupidest shit I've ever fucking heard. I can't. Is this a joke? Is it April Fool's Day? If they went out earlier, what the fuck? I do not <laughs> wish, but it's a hundred percent fucking serious article, dude. 100%. That is the dumbest shit. I, I don't even know how this fucking crap happens, man. Do you, do you guys remember year? I, I remember reading this shit years ago, but it pops up every once in a while still about on a hostage situation, shoot up into the wall over everybody's head, and that makes the hostage and the bad guy separate and start fighting, and then you can shoot the bad guy user. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about, man? But it, it's shit like that that comes, and you just, how the fuck does this even start? Where does this good idea come from? And nobody was is checking it and going, dude, you're an idiot, man. That is some stupid fucking shit. Go make up your own magazine if you want to publish that dumb shit. It is insanity. What, what the fuck is this front sight bullshit you're talking about? Don't use oh, your this is good. Oh, well, yeah. well, real quick, like, I don't know if Bills does, but we don't even fucking authorize warning shots. And if Dude, I, it's illegal in my city. If I did that, I'm committing a misdemeanor. Yeah, like, if I see you do that, I'm going to flick you in the fucking eyeball right there. I'm going to stop my response, fucking wind my hand up, and flick you right in the middle of your fucking eyeball, and then keep going. You're a fucking idiot. Okay, here, here's the punchline to the front sight one. The author is not listed. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Why, why I noticed that, too. What's up, that? What's up with that? Because there's a lot of people inquiring about it, and nobody's really uncovered who the fucking author of that article is yet. Yeah, it's point shooting, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's essentially trying to, like, make a case based off an esoteric uh, study on fucking eye movement to say that point shooting is legitimate because you can't see your sights. What, what study? Uh, let me look it up. I posted it to our mod chat or modcast 19. All right. So here's the deal on that, right? Four science did do a legit fucking review of what happens under stress. And there's a lot of factors that go into it. And the key word in that response to that threat is it's a spontaneous. So like you're fucking talking to the dude, you're fucking right in 68 and the 55 on a ticket and a dude produces a gun. Like it's well documented that one of the things that happens under the initial um, spontaneous um, activation of the sympathetic nervous system is that the eyes dilate. Um, tunnel vision is, is, is started by the um, orbital or the, by the brain, not by the eyes. The eyes dilate to try and bring it as much light as they can. And I use it as an example sometimes where if you ask guys that have ever been um, – had a uh, LASIK done, they get their eyes medically dilated. And you ask them, if you hold your finger out in front of you, could you see your finger? And they're like, no, because that requires constriction of the lens of the eyes. So there's some validity to it only on the spontaneous response. Like after the initial couple of seconds, guys can focus in. And one thing they found too under four science with uh, Bill Lewinsky is the more inoculated to stress an individual is, the less profound the stress response to the incident will be. So I think they're taking a small snippet of a study and trying to turn it into, like, we need to be at fucking 25 and dudes need to stop using the sights on the range. So, again, they're taking something completely out of fucking context, twisting it to how they want it to be, and then producing an article, and once again, the same theme, fucking driving traffic to the website. Well, in that case, it works because they're idiots. And we all want to read this for ourselves because we don't believe it. And here we can we can post it and we can point and laugh and say, ha, ah, funny, but ultimately they're getting paid. But I, I, met, I mentioned it last night. I'm sure that there's some anecdotal 
post shooting officer interviews where you have all these cops saying, uh, you know, I don't, I don't remember, I don't remember using my sights or I don't remember seeing my sights or whatever. But if we ask those same officers, you know, Hey, do you, do you remember taking your weapon off safe? Uh, you know, that th- we know that if the, you know, weapon had a, a manual safety, it came off cause the gun went off, but that officer's not going to be able to tell you that they consciously remember doing it. So, uh, you know, but more likely than not, if they were properly trained, uh, they got a flashlight picture in there and they just don't remember using a flashlight picture. And you can see that front and center with force on force training. Yeah, but, but unfortunately that what you just said right there, Roland is like the edification for all of the people that advocate for point shooting. They use that one little anecdotal thing. They, they, they completely fucking fail to mention that, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's, it's something that is happening in your brain, not something that is, you know, actually him point shooting, he might have actually fucking referenced off that front sight and the rear sight, but he just doesn't remember it. But they're taking it as, oh, sighted fire is not the fucking way to go. When the reality is, is there's plenty of performance data out there that says, especially when you consider like we were discussing, uh, you know, in the last 24 hours, sighted fire on the fucking areas that you need to hit is going to win that fight every time. And Reston's interview is a fucking prime example of that. Uh, just because you get hits on target, i.e. combat accuracy, does not fucking mean the guy is going to stop or that you're going to stop. And and I know this is going to fucking drive Bill crazy because I'm a fucking psychological nerd when it comes to it. But, you know, there's three levels of um, psychological retention of a subject. You've got the learning. You've got the muscle memory that everybody hates to term. And you've got subconscious competence where you can perform an action without conscious input and when you get guys that get to a proficient level on the range, when they get into those things that are spontaneous combustion, or I'm sorry, spontane- spontaneous response to a threat, they get into a level where they get into a kinesthetic performance event where they're so ingrained, it's a subconscious event, like Roland said, to get that flash sight picture where you see dudes that are still 15 yards away at the end of a hallway and they're still getting good hits, even though when you ask them, they're like, dude, I don't fucking remember it. So we can go to the range all day long and I teach guys to use sites at the three yard line because they're like, well, why do I need to use it? I can point you because when you look at the translation to skill set, if I can, I can teach you to use your, your sites at the three yard line and all the way back. And then if you find yourself in the position where you have to point shoot, you'll be better suited to do it versus flipping the tables. Now all you've ever done is point shoot out to, 10 yards, 15 yards, and I have to put you into a position where you have to do aim sighted fire, you're going to fall flat on your face. So they don't cross reference with each other. So, you know, you always take the route of the, of, of, of most resistance when it comes to training aim sighted fire has the, has the most cognitive input to success of firing. So always train for that. Don't train for the lowest common denominator where I'm like, I can reach out and touch the target. So I'm just going to point the weapon and shoot, still get on the sights. It'll help you in the long run. You know, I, I think I've read that uh, for science um, study they're talking about, if it's the same one. And they, um, I think they had like fucking glasses that they made dudes wear on this thing and it had cameras pointed at their pupil so they could record yeah. under high speed video when their eyes were dilated and they could tell based on what size the pupil was, what the guy was focused on, shit like that. Is that the same one? Yeah, yeah so they, were, well, they were judging him as they were looking at stimulus and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, they could, they, they were watching their eyes real close. So it, it, if my recollection is correct, the parameters of that study also included um, people that, for instance, my wife, who is not a shooter. So here's how you make a gun work. Step up, put these glasses on, and now we're going to make you do this. So completely fucking untrained people were also lumped into this study, if, I, if my recollection is right, up, into, up to uh, guys with a shitload of training. They may have done a different one. This one that I read, uh, which wasn't too far out, it was all cops. And they went to a PD, I want to say in Arizona, and they took literally dudes that were on the streets for two weeks all the way up to 30-year veterans and everything in between and evaluated experience okay. levels. Uh, yeah, my record, yeah, the one I'm thinking of is done at a university, but it sounds like it's the same basic fucking parameters. But they, So the dudes that with a lot of shooting experience and tactical experience and stress inoculation training and 
experience of, you know, for years of being a fucking police officer where, you know, occasionally you get a stressful fucking deal in your life. Um, those guys all performed much better and did indeed use their fucking sights, right? Yes. So what, what the fuck? They're, they're turning the, the study backwards. That's not the, the solution isn't point shooting. The solution is better fucking training and more stress inoculation based training for all fucking cops. So you take the two week dude and we, it's clear we're not giving them enough training to be successful on the street. And then I think your point is valid as well. When you say, hey, man, did you see your sights to a two week dude, particularly a guy that's never shot much? All he said is Academy uh, indoctrination and pistol shooting. You say, hey, man, did you see your sights? He instantly thinks of that fucking poster in the range that shows perfect sight alignment and perfect sight focus pre-ignition. And, and he didn't see that. He saw something kind of like that, but his brain on it goes, no, nah, I didn't see that fucking picture. Does that make sense? Now, he may have seen a front sight that was elevated in the rear or depressed or left or right in the notch, but it wasn't that perfect picture. And so he doesn't even process that he saw something that was sufficient to make those hits, if that makes fucking sense. No, but it doesn't. I've said for a long time, though, man, a lot of cops, when you talk about officer-involved shootings, right, you have shootings and you have gunfights. And I think in a lot of shootings where officers end up putting pills in dudes, there was no penalty for them not doing it. I mean, they were never at risk. The gun was unloaded. It was some type of toy gun. Um, whatever the fuck it is, the guy is still prompted and they were legally justified to shoot the dude. Um but maybe missed a chunk of the uh, stress involved. And then on the gunfight side, quite honestly, a bunch of cops are just fucking lucky. And it, it really what it is boils down to, right? I mean, there it wasn't the skill level that saved the day. It was they just happened to be less shitty than the bad guy. Um, and they scored enough hits to get, either get a psychological stop or they got fucking lucky and punched the dude in the head. But it wasn't an intentional act. It just fucking happened. Um, that a lot too. That's what I'm saying. I, I think we dodge, no pun intended, we dodge bullets a lot in law enforcement because we happen to meet dudes that are, are even less trained than the average fucking patrol guy. And so we get a W out of it. Um, and it's really not a fucking W. I, you know, I mean, I, never mind. I, I was going to say something, but it'll, I, this might get seen by somebody that knows who I'm talking about. So I'll disregard. Well, they, like, it, it, it might be my fault for applying uh, common sense to something that's stupid. Uh, but if, if point shooting is a real thing and people aren't just referencing off of a, a flashlight picture or a front sight or, or even the back of the slide, um, why not just shoot as soon as you clear a leather? Just shoot from the hip. If, if, that, if point shooting is a real thing and you can do it. Um, Their defense is yeah. because recoil control manipulation of the weapon. That's what they'll counter your argument to. It's, it's stupid, but that's what they'll counter it to. Dude, for for every when I know I've I've shanked a shot, you know, like I'm at a USPSA stage or IDPA or whatever. When I know I've shanked a fucking shot into the delta or into the no shoot, I can replay that in my head and go, you know what? That that was when I didn't have a fucking sight picture. You know. Hey Roland, would you mind retelling what you ask your students about the front sight? Yeah, I mean, I just make them, uh, you know, tell me a story. Um, t tell me a story about your front sight. And they'll look at me like, well, you know, what What do you mean? Um, and the, the example that I use is, uh, you know, students got a, a brand new 6004 Safari Land with the suede on the inside. And uh, they're you know, high profile front sight catches a little bit of suede. And, and as I'm walking by, I actually see a little, a little curly Q hanging off, hanging off the corner there. And, uh, so, you know, I'll ask the guy, Hey, t tell me a story about, about your front sight. And if that dude doesn't tell me that he has foreign debris hanging off the edge of his front sight, he's not, he's not looking at his front sight. Uh, he's not focused on his front sight enough. Like, you know, the, these guys need to be able to tell me, uh, you know, how, how is the, how is the sunlight reflecting off the top of the blade right now? Uh, have you worn down your finish to where you're getting, uh, you're getting, uh, some shine up there? Uh, have you dropped the gun in a fight before and your, um, right corner is, uh, is slightly bent in a little bit, you know, or rounded off more than, than your left corner. Uh, I, I, I want them to describe to me, 
what they what they're seeing in, in terms of the specificness of the shape and color uh, and shine uh, about that front sight. And if and if they're not able to do that, they're they're not they're not pulling their eyes off their target. They're staying they're staying front focused and not front sight focused. So, so last year we're, we're doing a uh, some follow up right now. We're in the middle of a uh, uh, what we call session training, which is multiple days. Of, you know, trying to get everybody in the agency through this training block, and we do three of those every single year. Last year we did some shit uh, with force on force, and it was all just based on uh, dudes uh, that were they were in the range. We kind of cordon off, cordon off a little area of it so they can only maneuver within that space. Um, and so basically it's, it's me and Shockey, right? We're in there we're, and we both get a, 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 a simunition pistol. So Shockey's going to be the bad guy for me. Uh, when he goes for his pistol, he can put it anywhere he wants in his pocket, shove it down the front of his pants, back of his pants, whatever the fuck. And then I'm going to draw from my duty gear um, and have a little, little, little shootout with him at pretty close ranges. Uh, and so we tell the guys, here's the print. As the cop, you can't go until the bad guy makes a move for his pistol, right? You got to see the gun. You got to do all that normal shit that we have to do to react to a threat. So Shockey jerks his pistol. I grab mine out. Um, uh, both patrol, I shouldn't say both, but most of the patrol guys that we had doing this, um, they're, they're starting to run around and they're just slinging pills as soon as the both guys, both the bad guy and the cop in this scenario, and they're just slinging fucking uh, simunition rounds around. We only gave them five uh, rounds in the magazine because we didn't want them to just keep blasting forever. Uh, but we had quite a few incidents where both guys, and we're talking distances of like seven feet, uh, are at slide block and they haven't made a single fucking hit out of 10 shots fired by two cops, no hits made because they're just shooting like fucking spazzes. Uh, and so, you know, hey, the, I, I, the obvious lesson there is you got to fucking aim these motherfuckers a little bit if you want to make a hit. And so as this shit progressed, um, and there's clearly some stress involved and, you know, guys know they're going to get stung and it's, you know, it's pretty not real difficult to shoot somebody at five, seven uh, feet, uh, whatever the fucking case was. And so I started going to the cop and I said, hey, man, just get in your fucking head right now that you are going to get hit with a sim pellet. You're going to get fucking hit. It, it, it's just going to happen, right? Rely on your armor. Uh, you you might take some fucking shots out into the fucking wings. If that case, you know, if that's the case, you're going to apply a tourniquet once you finish the job. You're going to live. It can be fine. The only thing you ain't going to survive is a shot right between the fucking eyes. And you'll never see that fucker coming, so quit worrying about it. So what I want you to do this time, when your partner goes to grab his gun out, I want you to draw your pistol, be very deliberate, find your sights, and poke a single round right in his goddamn head. Don't worry about how long it takes. Don't worry about that he's firing. If you're, you know, your first shot goes after his third, whatever the case is, just make that one good, accurate shot, find your sights, make the hit. And I'll be fucked if they weren't all drawing, finding sights, putting a headshot on a guy, in some cases moving, sometimes static, sometimes ducking, bobbing, weaving, whatever the fuck it is. But at those very close ranges, they were all able to track a dude, and these are not super-duper shooters, right? They're average patrol guys, but they could find that dude's head, put a round in it. In some cases, take zero shots while he was shooting at them, and in other cases, they got hit a little bit. But the end result is that guy is fucking done because you put lead in his fucking brain box, and now you can treat yourself, man. You got to be fucking deliberate with this shit. And sights are the only way that you're going to be able to put accurate gunfire on a guy, regardless of distance, regardless of the fucking stress, the scariness of it, and, the, and everything else. And if that, I mean, once they started doing that, everybody now is scoring multiple hits. And you could just see a difference in the way they were managing the tool, bringing it up, finding sights each time, uh, and now trying to actually put good hits on a guy. And But that was the stress inoculation part that was missing. They weren't comfortable with it until I talked them through it and they got there. And, I, and that isn't meant to be that I'm some super instructor. It's just pointing it out to guys that if you do find your sights, you are more likely to stop the threat faster, even though he's shooting at you. Who cares if he's making fucking noise, man? Put around in his head, put around the fucking thoracic cavity, and and let the bullets do their fucking job, and then you won't get hit. And if you do, then you got time to fucking treat yourself now because the threat's gone. That that was out of 160 cops last year. It was a pretty consistent thing. Uh, I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we're finding with our guys, again, average patrol dudes, they are better served draw, standing still, drawing the pistol, getting that first aim shot off, and then moving while they continue to shoot versus trying to move, draw the pistol, and make an accurate shot while moving. They're just missing more. And so when you look at the time delays and everything that's going on with it, uh, most of our guys are scoring headshots on the bad guy if they just stand, draw the pistol, put that first shot out, and then get to moving. 
So some of it, I mean, it's kind of counterintuitive. And I know for a long time, uh, you know, we're saying, hey, man, move when you get off, get off the line of tag. And I agree with all of that concept. But I think that what's missing there is the context potentially of the the, uh, the skill set of the guy running the gun. And I wish all cops um, had way more bullets and way more training time and were better uh, with their handguns and more proficient and actually gave a fuck. But that's just not the case. And so with that in mind, I think delivering the headshots probably more important than moving off the line of attack in most circumstances for the average patrol dude. Higher trained guys that are probably watching this or, or take note of what's going on in PNS are probably going, yeah, fuck that, I'm going to move. I, I agree, dude. If you're at that level, probably better served to do that. Um, but the average patrol guy ain't you. And so you got to kind of take that into consideration with some of this shit when you hear it pop up as well, right? What's the level of training? And a 10-year dude in my agency, that doesn't mean shit. Uh, it just doesn't mean shit, man. Um, you know, he, he might be a very good shooter. He might be the worst fucking guy you've ever seen with a gun. It really is dependent on how much effort he has put into getting proficient with those tools, man. So, One thing I want to add to Bill's thing real quick was um, on um, – fuck, I just lost my train of thought. On the aspect of um, using people's sights – I think uh, one thing important to remember is that, um, again, studies have shown that we are threat focused um, intuitively, uh, keyword being intuitively, but that can be very easily trained out of somebody, whereas we want to focus in on what the threat is doing, not narrow our focus in and bring it to the front sight post. And that has where um, red dots have really won. Um, for their ease of use and going from a three focal plane sighting system to a one focal sighting plane system because now we have a dot that's superimposed on a target but uh, we can try and train all we want on the range to try and get people to not be threat focused but rather focus on their front sight and in keeping with what Bill said I think the best way that you can get a guy to do that and kind of get the light bulb to go on is force on force where you got actually show guys anecdotal evidence were like look like you motherfuckers were seven feet apart 10 rounds not one dude's hit like i'm showing you whatever the fuck you're doing is not working so now listen get on that front site quit worried about being threat focused you still have your peripheral you still have all you know all the, the the other aspects of your vision to rely on and then all of a sudden dudes start getting hits and it's that light bulb moment and that's why the agencies that are just doing straight especially in the year 2016 are just doing straight range training are doing their dudes a fucking huge injustice because there's so much to be learned from doing force on force and not even learning from the instructor standpoint, but getting dudes light bulbs to turn on because guys are fucking hard headed. They're all type A's. Well, most are type A's where they don't want to believe you. They think they got it figured out. And when you can go on a force on force and show a motherfucker like, look, dude, I just fucking showed you this. You went in this room. This dude ate your fucking lunch and fucked your mother. Like, now you're fucked up. Stop doing what you think you have figured out and listen to what we're saying. And dudes come back in. They do what you tell them to do. They're successful at it. And all of a sudden, guys are like, fuck, okay, maybe this dude knows what he's talking about. And they kind of transition and shift what they're doing. And the big one is front sight because a lot of guys – Think like, oh, uh, like when I go into a room and I dig a corner on a 10 by 10 room, I don't need to get on my sights. Like I'm just going to sling that blaster out there in that corner and just start letting it go. And you see a fucking shadow around the fucking guy and he everything is hit around him except him. And that's when dudes have that light bulb moment. So um, for the dudes out there, you know, any LE guys out there that are trying to, you know, refute that whole front side thing, force on force is a way to go with it like Bill was talking about. Anyone have any further comments? I, I just say the proof of that is uh, with all of our SWAT team shootings, um, and I think I've had, I've seen 12 of my guys now uh, burn motherfuckers down. Um, yeah, 10 to 12. I don't remember exactly what the fuck the numbers, but anyway, but uh, you know, post mission and obviously once they're done with the with the officer investigation, all that kind of bullshit. Um, and man, I mean, you know how that go for it? And almost invariably, they've always said it felt like a fucking sim hit kind of tells me something, right? We're doing something right um, with our SWAT training and the amount of, of, of a neck inoculation and force on force shit we're doing it because, it, it, I mean, it's less scary on the fucking real ones than it has been on some of the fucking training hits, so. 
and Reston said the same thing. Have a question about a trigger. Geisley Tricon, anyone have it? Is it viable for home defense or duty? Uh, Gardner has one. It's basically an SD3. It's viable. It works. It's a flat butt trigger. It's good. It's just rebranded to Jeff Gonzalez's business, but it's just a slightly modified SD3 trigger. Cool. Is this, Next is this one. kind of the yeah. weight, the, uh, the hyperfire? Because I know that question came up a little while ago. Oh, we could talk about that. Uh, I wish I had a friend of mine here who's been fucking with one and is an armor for the one of the local agencies out here. Um, but he's uh, he's been actually pretty impressed with the trigger group as far as a safety side of things. Um, I need to get his ass a fucking webcam because <laughs> uh, he's he's he, I'm sure he'd have a lot of good stuff to add to this. But, yeah, uh, we probably should wait probably for Chad too. Yeah, that, that's that's armor esque escapade. So, but yeah, that that will be a future discussion. And what does it take for something to be deemed a duty worthy option? Shane brought up a question. This just came up in one of our groups. Uh, someone, I wouldn't say they re, uh, they didn't recommend it, but they mentioned a Trigicon reflex. That is some old technology that gets washed out with various types of light or the color of your of your target. If I rem if I remember correctly, also Mepro makes basically a clone of that. Why would this be even be a viable option for anyone other than price? Honestly, price isn't even worth it. You have the uh, Trigicon reflex lights clocking in at what six, almost seven hundred dollars. That's eight point two one right there for price points. I didn't know they were that expensive. Yeah, or an eight point pro. Just saying. Yeah, the whole argument about not needing batteries to me that's doesn't matter. I want to I want to adjust that brightness as I need it. Well, so the the big problem with the the reflex, um, so you, okay, you have the Trigicon thing, but like you said, as soon as you kick on whatever white light, especially with the modern white lights you're seeing that are, you know, at a minimum, I think the the standard white light is, you know, it's lacking if it's under 300 lumens, um, as far as the, the kind of the industry standards, the way we we've seen things. Uh, and then on top of that, you have various issues with the coloration of the actual diode itself for whatever, you know, Chevron. I've, 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 it's been a hot minute since I've looked through one of those. But the, uh, the standard color that I've seen is amber, which fucking sucks for picking out, you know, under any sort of quick stress, you know, or a quick, quick sight acquisition. Um, uh, we have the same ones at work in the Trigicon one and a half ACOG form. And uh, I mean, it says a lot when I, I fucking, you know, picked up a EOTech as soon as I could, cause the, the, the Amber gets washed out on every other surface out there. Um, it's not easy to pick up in low light. I can't see that Amber, you know, reticle or whether it's glowing under Trigicon, uh, under, under, you know, low light. I throw a white light on it. It fucking gets washed out. Like it's just, it's just a bad solution overall. And I mean, it, it, when you look at, especially like Trigicon or not Trigicon, um, aim points, even the aim point pro, which is basically like what a comp two or a comp three, essentially technology wise, um, that thing still has a battery life in what, five years. I'm not really fucking worried about, battery life being a, you know, a hinge benefit or this, this, you know, intrinsic value where people are so concerned about batteries, it goes back to the whole iron side thing where it's like, well, it, it costs batteries. So it's, it's bad now, at this point with certain brands and technologies, it's, it's as viable, if not more reliable as a, as an iron site, like an iron site gets beat. It's a, it's an external adjustment on a, 
piece of kit that if it's if it's not fold down it's going to be racked against you know whatever the hell you're using against so it's it's just as unreliable and unsteady as anything else batteries is a secondary concern at this point I just looked there uh, like 450 bones uh, for the non mag straight up straight down reflux uh, reflex rather uh, we had them for a little bit uh, put them on our uh, ended up stuffing them on our gas guns um, and even there they went the way of the dodo so yeah, the other they're yeah I don't I don't see why the fuck you would go looking for one for sure I mean if you got one for free I suppose it's better than nothing so are you fucking vaping mech what a queer. I fucking ran out of Copenhagen again. Leave me alone. Hey, and I got one quick alibi on uh, the topic of what Bill was talking about with guys moving um, before drawing. Like most people that draw and move or move on a magazine change don't really understand what they're doing. So you just break out a cert pistol or break out force on force and take your one or two steps to the left and see if the dude that's fucking firing at you still can't burn you the fuck now. So like if your intention is to move, like really fucking move or just fucking stay planted and take accurate shots because time and time again, I take guys who are like, yeah, I'll take my one or two steps to the right and for range safety reasons, we'll use a cert pistol and it's real fucking easy for a guy 10 yards from you to transition his pistol two inches to the left to track you as you move your one or two steps. So uh, I'm telling like guys just do it for no reason. They really don't understand why they're doing it. Just somebody fucking taught them. Um, some Instagram sensation taught them and they fucking do it now. And it's outdated fucking shit. Like either fucking seriously fucking move or stay planted and fucking return act your fire. Follow-up question. Actually, it's not a follow-up. Separate question. Ruger SR9C. Is there any reason someone should carry that as a life-dependent option when you have Glocks available? Someone just posted that and recommended it. Seriously? Oh, yeah. In novice group. It, dude, if, if it's all you can afford at the time and the price is right... Sure, um, but comma, if you can save up the extra fifty dollars and get a Glock, it might be uh, pretty. What's pretty the good. cost on those Mac? Do you know? I, I couldn't tell you, especially if it's, especially if it's used. Because because one thing to keep in mind too is that when it's a cop, you're not buying Glock at MSRP. You're buying Glock at Blue Label, which is four hundred fucking dollars. I don't give a fuck how fucking broke dick your pay is at your agency. If you can't afford four hundred dollars, you're doing something wrong in your fucking life. Or you're just the cheapest man ever. I guess it's better than a high point. <laughs> I don't need a boat anchor. Wow, somebody I really hope that guy's listening to this fucking thread. Oh no, no he isn't. And then in another thread, someone's uh suggesting a Bushnell what is it, a TRS twenty five for a duty gun. What's a TRS twenty five? Basically it looks like a micro. Oh, uh, yeah, no, just no. Uh, and that's not to say that Bushnell doesn't produce good optics. Um, there's a lot of, you know, their HDMR stuff for long gun stuff for the price point is an excellent scope. However, comma, um, when it comes to something you need to rely upon, mm, that's, that's the whole different ball game. Uh, if it's a competition gun, you know, I'm just slapping a scope on there because I've got limited funds, and I found a HDMR at $950 with an H59 uh, reticle that I got 
basically on a, a promo deal for military guys. Um, it got me into a horse reticle. It got me a, a higher magnification optic than I would normally have with my M110. And, you know, it checked a lot of boxes, locking turrets, et cetera, et cetera. It was a great buy for that particular, you know, role. And I would, you're seeing a lot of them on military guns at like USASOC and comps and the international sniper comp. Um, but for a red dot, um, when, especially when it's something that is completely untested in that vocation where, I mean, who knows what the guy's recommending him to. He might be a dude out in Arizona who has to keep that thing in a trunk and the thing's cooking to 150 degrees all day, every day. And he has to pull it out and actually use it. Um, dude, it, it, especially like, especially with the Aimpoint Pro, why, if it, is it that cheap that you can't afford the extra hundred dollars for an Aimpoint Pro? You can even find them used for 350 bucks, 300 bucks. Like it, it's not impossible if you, if you really hunt, um, and you're looking at something that has a very, very stable battery life, change it on your birthday, change all the, all the batteries on your aim points and various trigicons and whatnot on your birthday. And you will probably never kill a battery unless you're sitting out there in sub zero temperatures or cooking them in the back of your patrol car. It's, I had a battery from my T1 bought it in 09. I didn't change the battery until 2013. And one of those years I spent the entire tour in Iraq with that thing on for, with the exception of, uh, my, uh, going home for two weeks of leave. And then I turned it off and then came back, turned it back on, kept going, you know? So, uh, if that's not a, a pretty solid indictment of the, you know, or aim point for uh, for duty use. Uh, I don't know what is. They make great stuff. So let me just let me just fucking say something in response to a f- fucking threat going on in right now. Like if you're a fucking LE instructor, firearm instructor, like fuck you, you don't mean shit. Like straight, like fucking stop. I've turned out over a hundred fucking firearm instructors. Like, if you show up, shoot our fucking bullshit-ass fucking qualification, you pay attention for five days, you ominous dominance, I cut you a fucking certificate because you've made, met state quals. doesn't mean you're fucking hip to what's going on. So don't come in here slinging around, I'm a fucking fire instructor, because it doesn't mean fucking, it doesn't mean shit. So just fucking stop for anybody listening. God damn it. I suspect that person is not watching. And based on their recommendation, I don't know if they're going to last long because they're getting slapped. Holy fuck. And just so the viewers know, this is how it is when we have to deal with these types of threads, except it's usually in text. Isn't it fun? Okay, so I got a follow-on question. Um, The hypothetical, if striker-fired guns didn't exist, what hammer-fired gun would you prefer? Uh, for me, it's easy. It'd be a CZP09. That'd be a good good call. Pretty much any CZ75, because they're pretty damn common, especially outside the U.S. Yeah, I, I, the CZs are great. Um, you know, I, I don't particularly dig them, but they're certainly a robust gun. I think the SIG Classic um, series would, would serve a guy okay. Uh, you know, 226, 228, something like that, 229, um, chambered in 9 millimeter. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, either of those would be fine. I always forget about SIGs. I started with one. It was a good gun. Yeah, we uh, that's what we issued when I got uh, hired, and we, we still have some out in service, actually. The guys that uh, that have them still, just they don't want to switch out to the M&P and, or a Glock, so they're, that's what they're toting around, man. And they've been very robust guns, so. I still need to get a 320, though. I need to test fire one and handle one because... Just based on the feedback, it sounds like it's well worth my time. 
Yeah, I agree. Um, and matter of fact, I'm glad you said that because I might get one in for Phil Draw next week now that you mentioned it because, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'm certainly getting good feedback from him. Haven't touched one yet other than that shot. I monkey fucked one. I hate people. I don't blame you. I'm reading that right now, too. You know, the mods... I'm sorry, go ahead, man. Oh, I, I was going to say, you know, the mods here suck. <laughs> Who are the mods? <laughs> that uh, The question uh, referenced the TRS-25. Uh, I was trying to find, but I can't. Was it, was it specific? Was it for a duty gun? No, basically, it's the MRO thread in duty. But and then the someone said uh, he has, let's see here. I forgot what he says his primary optic is, but he has a spare uh, SWAT rifle that runs a Trijicon reflex. And his oh. buddy is using the Bushnell. I got you. Yeah, I might said that uh, the TRS-25, uh, it, I went and looked at it, and it's a... Uh, my, it, it's not the TRS-25, but it looks just like it. So I'm assuming it's the same Chinese factory, and they're just putting different names on them. Uh, but my son has one on his hobby gun, and uh, the, the tint on the glass is fucking horrible. It's really green. Uh, when you look through it, there's distortion you know, within the lens. Um, it has held up fine for him, but it, it's only a backpacking gun. And, you know, we take it up in the mountains, and then he fucking shoots whatever the fuck up there. Um, he has gotten moisture inside of it before. Um just from, you know, being out and exposing the elements and then uh, he comes home and throws it in that fucking Ziploc baggie of rice and it goes away. Uh, but again, he's not using it as a duty fucking optic. It's it's a plinking gun and fuck around gun for him. So, I mean, as a guy, if you want to do an intro, I guess, to Red Dots, whether or not you want to, you know, transition to that, maybe it's a good, you know, cheapy optic to put on a rifle that you don't intend to protect your life with if you wanted to fuck around with it. Um just to see the concept, I guess, of a red dot, because you can always transition it to a 22 or something else later on down the road. Um, but yeah, for a for a duty optic, I it's that's just that's a piss poor choice, man. It's just a piss poor choice. I, I I'd rather go irons, to be honest with you. Hey, shock. I'm thinking we need to just axe this guy. This is looking like some blatant lying, misrepresentation. What are you talking about? The 54 fucking K round count he's got supposedly Five stacked years. up on his burger. Yeah. Yep. No, no, you don't. You don't have 54,000 rounds for your gun. No, you don't. Stop. Ugh. I don't think I've seen this person up until now. Mm -hmm. And Philip just messaged me. Well, not just. He messaged me a, a little bit ago. He said he bought that Bushnell for one of the office Nerf guns. That's great in that role. Which thread is 54,000 round Ruger guy in? I'm looking for it. I can't find it. Which, it's, what is it? It's a novice. Yeah, but which one? It is uh, Ryan Martinez. I currently carry an MMP40C. Mm, all right, I think I saw that one. Which, that's a good question. Man, why isn't Shane in here or on this? It's 
So the uh, this <laughs> it gets fucking better. I can see all the carry going. Oh, just fucking stop. You don't have 55 fucking rounds to your concealed carry gun in five years. Uh, Better. Do you see uh, what just got posted? Uh, it's it's my concealed carry gun. My duty gun is an M9. Unfortunately, the military doesn't give me a choice. Uh, apparently, we're getting butt hurt. So, fucking boot. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know where the fuck you're getting your nine mil, but that's uh, how much money for fifty nine, yeah, four thousand rounds. He steals it from the military, and Roland doesn't have toilet paper. Now that was years ago. It's a she, so if she's had it for five years. That's ten thousand rounds a year. I'm not buying it. Do you think it's really a she though? The name's a she, but the pictures aren't. No, uh, no, I just looked up the pictures. Yeah, it looks like a sheep. Just so you guys know, Matt Shockey, he's not a Glock fanboy. He's a common sense fanboy. Man, we need to do this more often. Yeah, I'm going to see what I can find open source about this person. Stand by. <laughs> this is what mod stuff's all about. And it's not because they're saying something that's that we don't necessarily agree with. We, it's just that they're saying something that we know is wrong. So doing a quick fucking number crunch. Uh, so if it, feasibly, if you're able to get 50 rounds of nine millimeter for $15, you know, which is around the average price that you're going to get at a gun store all over the United States, um, that comes out to $16,000. Um, so either you're stealing it from uncle Sam or you have spent $16,000 on nine millimeter ammo in I didn't even know the the time frame that you're shooting this in. In five years. Five years. That's on a military budget. If that's what they're representing as, that's fucking unfeasible, man. Like, unless you're loading your own. So I get free ammunition through work. My office is 100 yards from the range. I'm allocated 10,000 rounds of 9mm annually. And I seriously have to fucking work to shoot that much because I have a job and other shit going on. I mean, it is it takes effort for me to shoot 10,000 rounds a year out of my pistol. So don't, this is fucking bullshit. I, <laughs> I mean, it is so grossly overinflated that it's fucking comical. It's It's nonsense. I wonder if it's a, uh, you know, for every box you shoot, you just round that up to the nearest thousand. Well, isn't that the, isn't that the rule of thumb right there? Any number someone throws out, divide it by 10 at the minimum, at least online. This is why aliens don't talk to us. Yes. And you know, it's a shame because all this is not going to make any final cut of anything because no one's going to understand what's going on. You know what? We need to just... do It's better for them if they don't. Yeah. <laughs> we just need to, uh, we just need to jump on this every time we have an issue with someone and it's going to be pure entertainment and just to watch, you know what? I should just leave the camera on Shockey because you can just see how frustrated he is. Mechley just dropped the knowledge. Oh, oh, let's see how they respond. I want to ask what rank. And okay, you're a fucking military MP instructor in Wisconsin. Cool story, bro. Walter so PPQ, trigger out of the box, destroys the Glock. Excellent natural point of aim. Multiple backstraps. Natural point of aim, isn't that something you just kind of train with? Train to do? 
Oh, response time. The, the Walter is known as the sniper's pistol. Oh, I think we just had a self-select. <laughs> I got Terrell's attention. Finally. He's like, what? What pistol is this? Sniper pistol? What the fuck? <laughs> Please put the pipe down. Please step away from the pipe. I, I didn't realize they legalized weed smoking in the fucking army or whatever service you're a part of. Could be true, though. I mean, he, that could be the reason that the reserves, because they're at Fort McCoy, Wisconsin, have no ammo because this guy has shot every single bit of it. Yeah, do, do they? Do people even realize how hard it is for fucking your average grunt unit to get fucking nine millimeter? Like it might as well be, like it might as well be fucking non-existent. I bet it would be easier to find rounds for like a buffalo gun. Like some sort of magnum caliber shit you put in a buffalo gun side by side. That's how easy it is to get nine mil in the army. And then the the, the 9, 1911 crowd creeps up and rears their fucking head. Because we all know nine millimeter 1911s work so well. There's always that nine millimeter shortage in the military. But honestly, even though it has a dotic and all that jazz, it all depends on how you can articulate it. When we were in Afghanistan, uh, we had troubles sourcing 9mm. So finally, we decided to think outside the box. And our local AMP commander, I don't know where the hell he got it from, but he had this MMP9. And uh, we actually called back to Smith & Wesson, tried to run the serial number and figure out how the hell it got over there. But um, doing the whole buddy-buddy thing, he didn't have any ammo for it. And so we sent the request up to uh, Brigade, and we were like, hey, this guy wants 5,000 9-millimeter rounds. And sure enough, Brigade kicks that request up to Division. Division kicks out 5,000 rounds down to us, and we're like, you know what? Uh, we're going to keep these 4,900 rounds for ourselves for sustainment training. And uh, here's a 100-box round count of 9 mil for a local AMP dude. And he was fucking overjoyed. So it all depends on how you can articulate it too. I, I want to know what governing body has dubbed the Walter PPQ the sniper's pistol. That's, I'm curious. Wait, is this the same thread? Yeah, yeah. It just posted up. The guy, the Walter PPQ is cat's ass way better than the Glock out of the box. Uh, much more pointable <laughs> amongst other shit. But at the end, he says they don't call it the sniper's pistol for no reason. So I just asked him, who, who the fuck calls it that? I'm, I, is it, I mean, who is it? What, what group of snipers have dubbed it that? I'd like to know. Well, I mean, that's kind of cool. <laughs> sniper carries a Glock, just saying. We hit the fucking gold mine with this thread. Good God. That thread right there is like the perfect example of why I don't do open enrollment courses. Well, I think it, it comes down to a lot of mis or inexperience um, on the shooter side. And then there's a, a heavy dose of emotional. Investment. Wait, 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 wait. The fucking guy that sold it to him told him it's a fucking sniper's pistol, so fucking goddamn it, it's a sniper's pistol, guys. Oh, if that's the case. Yep, yep. The fucking guy gained him out and told him this is a fucking sniper's pistol. Um, <laughs> unfuck all of yourselves, you are fucking wrong. Well, apparently I've been fucked up for a long time, so. I didn't mean to fuck your night over, Meckley, but you're fucked up, dude. You've been doing it all wrong all along.
I, I, I'm, I can't wait to hear this because I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm off tomorrow. I'm gonna go get me a Walther PPQ. If that shit is a sniper's pistol, I mean, for fuck's sake, I want, I want to be that accurate with a pistol. Now I have heard good stuff about some of the Walthers. I'm not sure which, or if it was singular, but yeah. I think the PPQ is about the only one I would actually trust as far as I can fucking throw the thing. Um, but watching all the pistols at the range that I worked at come back in, the the one commonality I found with Walthers is that their ejectors would fucking break because um, they still use all the same design and it's all that tiny little fucking claw that's really weak when you really look at it. And the, uh, the spring that's on that ejector, and I'm no armor by any means, but the... The spring that's on that ejector is really weak. The ejector itself is a very fucking slim part. The only thing that separates the PPQ from that, um, from pre previous Walther designs, was the they beefed up that ejector. It's actually a, a fucking fairly robust part. Um, but that's not a, an endorsement of the PPQ at all, uh, just because I haven't seen any significant amount of round counts. It does have a nice trigger, but the VP9's got a nice trigger. You know, I mean, and it's not its not as awesome as they make it out to be. Well, I have a Smith & Wesson 340 PD, and this is the Machine Gunner's pistol, endorsed by machine gunners everywhere. So, insane. Oh, yeah? <laughs> it's pretty pretty well, cool. I have, well, let's see here. Yes, the Roland Special. Thank you. <laughs> and, endorsed by dudes named Roland everywhere. <laughs> That's right. Matter of fact, I believe that's the first cloned Roland special. Thank you. Someday we'll hear the story. It's probably going to be on the Glock-specific episode. Well, this fucking pistol is not a Roland special, but four out of five Dennis agree it is superior to others. <laughs> so let's see here. We have Aaron. We have... And the one out of five is the guy in this fucking thread. Yep. Yep. Time to do some cross referencing. Uh, and uh, if you if you don't have the chat window open up, uh, look there because. I'm sure. I'm sure Shockey and Bill are fucking tracking on this one. Which chat? Oh, no. Which chat window? We have like twelve. Uh, the one that's on the Hangouts. Oh no. Is it recent? Oh yeah, same same thread we've been talking about. The mods here suck. The funny thing is, it's only going to be but a phone call away to find out how full of shit somebody is and then put them on blast. That's all I'm saying is because... It's only about fucking four degrees of separation for me and anybody else in your fucking army. That's all it is. Fucking even less than that. Fucking, uh, uh, so I, I talked to Stan, and yeah, he was one of the guys out there smoking the dog shit out of me in my fucking ghillie suit in Fort Benning. <laughs> I was like, I thought I recognized you. Yeah, so it, it's not that big at all. The, the circle's extremely fucking tight. Just got a request to post pictures. I'm going to do one better. Post pictures of what? Of the conversation. Uh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> well, she's still hanging around. She hasn't self-selected yet. I just checked. People really don't understand how far our reach can go. Yeah, that's kind of scary, but it's true. And the army makes it easy. I mean, all you need is AKO white pages, and that brings up pretty much anyone. 
Yeah, Bronson, I, man, I, exactly what Meckley and Terrell were just saying. They, in the cop community, they, they, you've been around a minute. You, 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 obviously, I know a dude in Idaho who knows a guy in Montana who knows a guy in Nebraska and on and on and on. I mean, we can reach out and vet your shit nationwide pretty goddamn easy. It ain't that tough. <laughs> And one so of I'm, our, I'm oh, calling Brian saying I, I think Brian saying may be the one who called it a, a, a sniper pistol. I, that's what I'm going to blame it on. Let's all blame it on Brian right now. He'll be happy with this. Sometimes I wonder if it's just people trolling for the the sake of fucking trolling. Because some of these responses are just, God damn it, man. Like, <laughs> well, if you didn't notice, bro, Roland dropped the fuck off right when this shit started. So I think he went and made up some fake ass profiles and is fucking with us. He's chucking his ass off right now, listening to this shit. <laughs> One of our well known instructor armor guys just messaged me saying he can't even afford that kind of ammo. Or that kind of round count. Yeah, I don't think people really conceptualize when they're saying, oh, I've got fucking 30,000 rounds through X fucking platform. Okay, over how many years? Oh, three years. All right, dude, look. Especially if you're a fucking cop or you're in a, I'm not talking like, you know, Bill's specific circumstance. If you're a guy, and I'm not saying anything that anybody doesn't know here, but if you're... A, a regular patrol cop, unless you're sponsored by some fucking ammo company and you're a three gun shooter or whatever, you're not putting that many rounds down range. It's full stop. Like, you can't afford to. 16000 fucking. $16,000 roughly, give or take, plus or minus 1000 It sounds like you need to restart your connection. Again. Yep. Damn it, Mackley. You're worse than Bill. Right, with my new microphone, I'm fucking gold, man. Yes, you are. <laughs> Another thing people aren't taking into account, let's say 50,000 rounds in five years, is weapons maintenance. You're going to have to swap out parts. You're going to have to buy new barrels, possibly, depending on your weapon, because that shit's going to be shot out. I mean, all that stuff adds up. And that's in excess of however much your money you're dropping on ammo, which in this case is upwards of $16,000. Me, I could do that as a single dude. But when you have family and all that stuff, you have a full-time job, just like Bill said. I mean, that takes up a lot of time. Well, consider all the people that are throwing out these huge round counts, and they're getting following because of that, and no one's checking. No one's even – no one's doing the math or – or thinking about is this feasible, dude? Even so, it, with my company, if I if if I'm being hosted by an agency, part of the host agreement is they will provide me with demo ammo because the shit's fucking expensive. So you know what I'm saying? I, I'm trying to. I, it, it's, it's just crazy. Or either the some bitch is stealing shit from the military. One of the two. And we were just told, if we want more info on the MRO, we need to check out a certain instructor's YouTube page because he's really big on it. There's been some inaccurate information coming from that source. Put it in the chat. No, I don't want to. We're uh, we're filtering one right now. So I'm digging up pretty much anything. Yeah, we have is inaccurate. So we have an MRO on one of our SWAT guns right now that we're we're doing a field trial on. Well, I have one. It's it's fine. Yeah, no he's issues. Got, I think he's had it for two months or maybe a month and a half. I don't know, but yeah, it's been it's been holding up fine. I'm not a big fan of it. Between the fishbowl effect and the blue tinted lens, for me, there's better options out there. The price point is good, but that's it's a case of you get what you pay for. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. That, that lens is, uh, yeah, I don't dig it at all. And I don't, I mean, the claims of bigger field of view to me are nonsense. I shoot both eyes open anyway. And uh, so I, I don't fucking notice. I, I absolutely hate the Trigicon blue tinted lens thing. It drives me bonkers. You know, though, at least no one had an ND in a bathroom. That's That's a good thing. Oh, snap. We going there? No. A derp lodestone. Yeah, I can be eloquent when I need to be. You normally are. What are you talking about? I sound like an idiot when I'm just talking. It's uh, it's when I can actually get behind a keyboard and think for two seconds about what I'm going to say. Or is that more of a function of your internet? Sounding like a robot doing the old Steve Fisher? My, uh, my nickname from my job is actually MacBot, so long story short, so that, that says anything. I don't think Snapper guy's going to tell me what organization gave it that fucking accolade. But I would, if I was Mr. Walter, I would sure as fuck stencil that shit on the side of my gun. Sniper's pistol, purr. <laughs> I'd change the name from PPQ. That's what I'm saying. You would call it the Sniper Special. Fuck okay. yeah. Damn, I got to get me that fucking gun. That is some badass shit. <laughs> Shit, I'd buy two of those motherfuckers, man. Good for 50,000 fucking rounds, plus it's a sniper's pistol. I'd never have to buy another gun with that kind of endurance. I mean, shit. And accuracy? Accurate enough to be the sniper's pistol? Well, and those are two different guns, bottles. though. I'd turn, in my fuck, I'd turn in my AR and my shotgun. Like, fuck it, I'm done. Got fucking all-purpose right here, bitch. <laughs> That's all you need, man. And you could, you could hit a propane bottle at 1,000 meters. Oh, I, I read that there. somewhere. Fucking digging up ancient history over here. No, oh, man. Terrell, Terrell's on the money, dude. It is it is the Mosin Nagant of pistols, man. <laughs> Any, anybody see that uh, that video? I'm sure Chad would have. I think Chad actually posted it, but the losing his fucking mind on the, the threading of the barrel for a muzzle brake. Yes. Or no, it was actually for a fucking suppressor with a drill. There was no guide. There was no actual... It wasn't a... I on my Facebook page. Oh, sweet fucking Christ. Like, it's on my, if anybody wants to see it, it's on my face. It's Iraq veteran 8888. He's like, check this shit. This is awesome. The quickest way from A to baffle strike without even fucking... You know, the cheapest way to, to waste an entire tax stamp. Just right there. Now, be fair, it did have a plug that went down the barrel to guide it. <laughs> Not that that's fucking up the inside of the bore or anything, but it guides it. You fuckers don't know enough about precision machinery work to be fucking casting stones with that awesome fucking tool. That thing is badass. You know, I'm just disappointed Roland isn't here to laugh with us. I don't, I don't know how that dude keeps up the pace that he does. That, that's impressive, especially with the amount of sleep he gets. I was just looking on uh, on Horner's Facebook page. He's talking about his uh, his STI uh, 2011. Oh, I thought you were about for... his, 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 his sniper pistol. Never mind. Go ahead. Nah, yeah, he's got a 2011. He's had it for 12 years. He's put three barrels through it, two coatings, and he's had 4, 400,000 rounds through it. But that's a sponsored freaking three gun shooter, AMU shooter. In twelve years, he only did he did four four hundred k rounds with a pistol. But his he gets his pistols rebuilt for free by the best gunsmiths in the world whenever he wants. 
It, it, it's not as bad as uh, a a a uh, land fair. What was it the other night? What was it? Uh, four and a half million rounds. Oh, I don't remember. Wow. Who who saw that? The four and a half million rounds guy. Yeah, I remember seeing that. That Navy SEAL dude. Yeah, yeah, four and a half million rounds. I'm like, that's funny because fucking Todd Jarrett said he's at about four million himself, and he's a career professional shooter. I think I missed that one. Yeah, you didn't miss much, but it was You're pretty really fucking epic. Man. We're like, dude, what are you talking about? He's like, take my fucking advice. I got four and a half million rounds on a two, and just fucking gridlock that fucking thread. Was that the uh, the 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 Tyler guy? Yep, that's him. Was that's it? The dude yeah. Where all of his teammates talk shit on him. Yeah, what what was that? It was the uh, it was what was the subject of the the thread? Because I I think I dived in on that one and I just it was like beating my head against the fucking wall. Optics? No, it was I don't know what it was. It was something the, else. Finger. It was uh, the high index of the finger on the the slide itself. Like they putting it as high as you can on the finger for a safety thing. As far as like. Not keeping it, you know, hovering over the trigger. So if you fall, which is, from personal experience, a very real fucking thing, um, you don't clench and cook off the fucking round. And he he couldn't wrap his mind around that. Like, dude, it it it's not going to slow you down because all that's fun time. Um, it's kind of like throwing your gun on safe between reloads, throwing your AR on safe between reloads, regardless of what you need it's like it, it doesn't fucking slow you down at all like the the physical movement of moving your finger here to here doesn't slow you down because the entire extension here to here it's all junk you're not shooting so why do you care about how far that finger has to go like it it's very limited thinking on the part of uh that guy and four and a half million know. rounds? Are you fucking serious? You might have watched four and a half million rounds over an entire twenty-year career, but personally, no. That that one was a, a mountain made out of a, a molehill. Because that I think that one's a personal preference. Like I don't index to the top of my slide, but that's me. Like if you show up and you do it, like fucking cool. More power to you. Yeah, I, I, I can't index to the top of my slide. <laughs> Now I'm uh I got fucking huge dick beaters, so I index off of my fucking slide release. But most people's fingers can't reach that far. So all the way f over the top and down to the slide release. That's unreal. Yeah, the way I do it is I just index along the top. I don't hook over. So high register would be right here. There's a, a topic we're talking about where uh, someone posted the image of Jeff Blumen with arm dynamics in that he actually had his finger over the top of the slide. And uh, we're going to have him on Modcast one of these days. But uh, to me, that's just one uncomfortable. I have prior hand injuries and figure it doesn't really work that well. So I just index at the top. And uh, the reason behind that is involuntary hand contraction. So um, just like Mech was saying, uh, if you fall, I mean, let me get out my circle real quick so I don't try this Haley up in this bitch. So if you fall and your hand is, your finger is indexed along here, it's going to go right to the trigger guard. Whereas if you do a high index, then there's incoming rounds with ball catching in your face. You're like, fuck. It's hey, Mike, still, your, camera's, your camera's dead, dude. If you're demoing shit, we can't. All we're seeing is black. God damn it. I know, right? I can see myself on this. I'm not sure why it's not kicking up. Yeah, the image I'm seeing, you're like frozen in place.
You all, you guys do that index up in the fucking projection port? I don't. Yeah, I don't either. I just push it above the actual frame as far enough as I can get it, you know, high, not fucking curling over, just push it up over that frame thing so I've got a solid abutment against my finger. Yeah, like you're doing. So Basically. for me to get into the trigger guard, it actually breaks my grip. I'm further down on the back strap than if I just stay up in here and index in this fashion. Mm -hmm. So... Well, has all the excitement died down? Um, what the fuck, Mick? He's like our fucking video. My God, what's going on? <laughs> He's ain't coming through in the clutch for us. Stolen know, right? valor. It's working on my end. I don't know why it's not going across everybody else. You, you might have valor. to uh, exit the entire browser and then completely load it up again. I know I've been having issues with that. Gotcha. Or the or the entire was, uh, internet. video going through earlier? No. All right, I'll troubleshoot some stuff after we sign off here and try to figure out what's what. You've been sitting very still all night. <laughs> well, should we call it? I'm not seeing it. I was here on the West Coast, which is fine. I don't know what's, what's going on yeah. with you. <laughs> well, Bill is too, but he still needs to sleep. Yeah, exactly. Eight hours every day. Talk about your PT and going back to that. Got to get that eight hours of sleep. And he's talking yes. about his nap, his eight hours. <laughs> yeah, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in anywhere. So. Nope. You'll have some good questions tonight. Although, uh, I'm still trying to... I'd be cool if I could shoot 50,000 rounds of 9 mil in, in the next couple of years. Well, Roland was is, talking about If you shot that many that. rounds, hmm? yeah. If you shot that many rounds, then you should be pretty goddamn proficient. I'm just saying. If not, maybe you could sling lead, but if you're actually training with it, you should be pretty proficient. Uh, whoever that person was. I was okay. going to say, uh, Amy Fortune, I want to see your BA bull at 25 meters. Yeah, no doubt. And if that's the case, if they're going to be that successful or that efficient, why the hell are they still sticking with that pistol? You know how, how many Glock 19s you could buy for 54,000 rounds of 9 millimeter? All of them. <laughs> well, should we kill? Sounds good on my end. Yep. Now we won't have our, our usual debrief with Roland. We usually <laughs> roll for a couple hours after. <laughs> He's probably already asleep. It is Sunday after all. Well, oh, yeah. Sleeps. Supposedly. Actually, yes. We He has snored on the show before. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes. Are you drinking me <laughs> again? Which video? Ah. Washington's best, man. So you notice this is how Matt starts out. He starts out with some highfalutin freaking nice good beer from some quaint little shop around the corner. By the end of the night, he's like, fuck it. Let me get a rain here. It's because if I drink stout or porter all night, I'll just be, or IPAs for that matter, just be completely shitty within like three hours. So got to, got to, got to moderate. Well, you're a moderator. Ah. Uh, and, and just so everyone knows, Roland, he doesn't sleep. He just waits. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, Go there. that's what Wix, Wix just said that. I have to give the guy credit. That's because he calls him sir. That's right. Yes, sir. <laughs> that would be episode 4-4 when that all started.
one of my favorites. Now, is, I can't tell sometimes, if, is he doing that ironically or is he doing that literally? I don't know. It's entertaining. He's like, I cannot tell, man. That That's one of those dudes like Bill who's got the driest sense of humor known to man. And you can't tell when he's fucking with you until about two hours later when you're thinking about it. Or three weeks when you rewatch the podcast. Right. Well, anyone have anything to plug? Bill never has anything to plug. He's no fun. One of these days, you guys are going to like do commercials or something for yourself. Well, I mean, if you're going to give me the floor, then I'd like to recommend the Walther PPQ. It is the sniper's pistol. <laughs> Get one today, kids. Nice. Fine, I'll say my... Oh, and yeah, we don't really have a closing thing yet, so... Think of something. I'm not going to go 10-8 or anything like that. <laughs> Are they, were we supposed to be getting some kind of cool uh, intro and outro music wow. with, with videos yeah. and shit? Where's that coming? Yeah. You, need to, you need to step up your job as the boss around here, man. There's some lazy shit going on. A video should have yeah, been produced. Is. And the moderators just suck. <laughs> suck. <laughs> You know that's a cool aspect of all, all this how well we get along and we want to hang out like it shot that was really cool just to be able to hang out with everyone yeah man good group of dudes for sure <clears throat> except for ethan yeah it's all man. his fault where where has that dude been flying lots of flying Okay. I, I I call, it. It. call it. Call it. Cut it okay. I'll, I'll, I'll call it. That was, let's see here. What was this? 19? 18, I thought. 19, I think. 19, yeah. Okay, hold so on. Think, dude, hold on. Oh, dude, just, dude just responded finally, man. It turns out nothing fancy has deemed it the sniper's pistol. Because so, you're not quality. So <laughs> that's quality. expert right there. <laughs> so there you go. So how many hours of video did he have to watch to finally come to that conclusion? I was about to say. <laughs> I, uh, I would guess that his years of experience as a sniper probably is what made him be able to call it that. The sniper's pistol. <clears throat> yep. Man, now you we guys know. are jerks. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to help us. Okay, well, I'll close it up. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, this is episode 19 of Modcast. We really didn't cover anything. It was a big waste of time, but we got some good laughs. I'm going to go to bed now. <laughs>